What is up, everybody? Welcome back to the City Life Project YouTube channel for yet another picks and predictions video. And today we got on the mighty J Wolf back on here to preview Ryzen 47 coming up this weekend. What's up, J Wolf? Thanks for joining the show again. What's up, brother? How you doing, Aisha? Man, so great to be back on your show. I love the City Life Project. You guys are just uh, fantastic. I love the content you guys put out. I don't know if you guys just saw on his uh, previous show that he did with Drew from the We Are Rising podcast. It was absolutely fantastic and impromptu little hour-long show. I highly recommend everybody go check that out. Uh, I actually just do fantastic work with, with these with these, the City Life Project podcast with your fire edits that you add in everything. It's just and such a and you're so passionate about the Epic Rising Fighting Federation that I love so much the Superior Rule Set. And when we talk about the Superior Rule Set, we're talking about of course the the Almighty Pride FC rules, Pride rules. And of course we're talking about when we say that we're saying you know soccer kicks, stomps, grounded knees, ground up kicks, and also that. What well, uh, the Epic Rising allows is twelve to six elbows. They added all elbows in from from the uh, the Almighty Pride FC rules. That's why we call it the Superior Rule Set because upgraded Pride rules. So it's just it's just a pleasure to be here, uh, Aisha. I just can't wait to talk about this this Epic Rising Forty Seven card with you. I mean, how fun is this card? It's it's going to be awesome. This is the most international fights we've had on a, on a Rising in a long time since the you know before the pandemic, basically. So it's just, man, I just can't wait. Like I said, I, I love the passion you bring, Aisha. I love being on your show. It's so much fun. The last show that we did was arguably one of the most fun uh, podcasts I've ever done. So it, it just, I can't wait to get into the show with you, brother. It's going to be awesome. Hey, likewise, man. And you guys at the We Are Rising podcast do amazing work as well. So I appreciate that. And, uh... Let's get right into it. Let's start with the first fight on the card here. Uh, what are your thoughts on this one? I'll throw it to you to start this one off. Well, this is this is the open finger glove kickboxing match, right? Yeah. So so basically, it's it's the basically it's MMA gloves, but it's kickboxing rules, right? So it's going to be pretty cool. I mean, those have always brought you know been bangers every single time they've done them. Like um, uh, uh, Yaman made those you know made them famous and arguably kickstarted them well on the japanese scene and just the fans have loved them and you know they've been doing some bare knuckle boxing bkfc crossover bouts i love it by the way absolutely love that so much absolutely yeah it's just awesome and and, and, and you know they're actually sending over the guy that that, that did the bkfc yep. bout in rising 46 they're sending him over to america to fight in, in the bkfc so that's gonna be freaking awesome. And um, but on this this fight right here, this is open finger glove. So I mean, a small glove kickboxing. So and they, they every single time it's happened before, it's always been bangers. So I'm really looking forward to this one. And you know, to if I had to pick a winner, I don't know. It's it's you know they're both they're both you know over 35. They're both got veterans of the fight game. So I don't know. It's like. You know, Uwe Foyce, full swing. You know, he, he always, they, they call him full swing for a reason. You know, he, he's the one that comes out, walks out with a bat, you know, based on because he always swings for the fences, right? So, you know, he's going to be looking to take, knock his head off. And, and with open finger gloves, if he lands, that could be all, all she wrote for it. So I guess I'm going to go with full swing here. Cause I, I like full swing. He's, he's a good fighter. Okay, uh, so for me, I'm actually going to go with Genji Umeno for this one. This is obviously like the battle of, I don't want to say old timers, but like guys in their, you know, mid to late 30s. I think, you know, this isn't MMA, this is kickboxing, and I, I love the small gloves too. Like, as much as we rip on one championship these days, I love those Friday fights. You know, the Muay Thai with the small gloves, they're, they're absolutely insane. And we had uh, Muay Thai legend Liam Harrison on the show a few months ago, and he just says that it's... It is the most brutal version of Muay Thai, and he trained, you know, and, and fought in all of, you know, the Thai promotions and stadium series out there, and he said there's nothing like the the MMA gloves in, in Muay Thai and kickboxing, so I really, really love that Ryzen is doing more of this. Though Full Swing, I think, overall is the better MMA striker, this isn't MMA striking, right? And, and though they kind of look the same at some points and with the smaller gloves it's really going to look the same it's a completely different sport for a reason they both have power but 
I, I like Umeno here. I think he did a great job against Sato in his last fight, who's also a very good kickboxer. Uh, I think he has way more experience in the sport of kickboxing, where Full Swing, again, has a ton of knockouts in mixed martial arts, and he's a great mixed martial arts striker. I think he's a little bit younger, too, and has less wear and tear on the body from, like, an MMA perspective. Because, yeah... He may have got punched in the face a lot. He may have got kicked in the legs a lot. But MMA, like, you got back issues. You got knee issues. You may not, you may not be as, you may not have been concussed as many times. But, you know, there's just more wear and tear on the body that can maybe slow down some of those quick combos that you see, you know, after the first round, after a few minutes. We're, we're going against each other on this one. I got Umeno uh, winning uh, this kickboxing one. Nice, nice. I like that. So we'll, we'll see, we'll see how it goes. If, if full swings and swing for the fences and land that home run shot. Or if Amanda's going to show us a veteran savvy and, and get the W in the, in the kickboxing, small gold kickboxing. So that's, that's a good prediction. On Tapology, I think it says, let me see. Oh, they don't even have the one for, never mind. It doesn't have it. It only has it for the mixed martial arts bouts. <laughs> well, speaking of mixed martial arts, let's get to it. We got Kazuki Tok. Kotugodome against Show Patrick Usami. Tukudome, 20 wins, 11 losses, 1 draw. Tukudome, 37 years of age. Usami, the young gun coming in here, 24 years of age. 6-2 and two as a pro, but 3-2 and two in his last 5 fights. I know Kazuki Tokudome has actually been off for three years. Uh, our boy Andrew at the We Are Rising podcast filled me in and said that he's actually been working you know, at a, at a government job for the last three years and hasn't been active in the world of fighting now he has been training he's a very good striker very well rounded who are you picking for this one though you picking the young gun or you picking the veteran coming back into the fight game yeah yeah i'm picking the young gun absolutely show patrick asami you know they on the on the breakdown that they have for the you know on, on their twitter accounts they're building this as the the veteran versus the, the up and coming rising fighter so I, i'm leaning towards the younger the young gun here both of these guys are excellent strikers. Excellent. I mean, it's, it's going to be a good matchup, but I just think the, the youth is just going to be too much for the veteran to overcome, even though he's got way more experience. But Usama, he, he's a good fighter, man. So it, it's, it, and he's only, he's not even 25 yet. Like you were saying, he's 24. So that's, <laughs> dude, that's, that's prime time right there for a fighter. I mean, it's just, this has, this has the young gun. Uh, you know, rising, you know, all written all over it, basically. So I, I expect a firefight. I expect, you know, you know, this is actually one of the only ones that's Japan versus Japan, actually. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I still, I'm, spe I'm expecting a young gun here to, to get the victory, but we'll see how it goes. I mean, the veterans got, you know, Tugodome got a lot of experience here, so we'll, we'll see how it goes. But yeah, on the breakdown, Honestly, that's how they, that's how they build it. Honestly, Jay Wolf, if he didn't take three years off. You know, again, I know he's still training, but if he didn't take three years off, like I, I would, I would pick him easily, despite his age, because he's got ten KO TKOs, three submissions, seven decisions. He's fought in one, he's fought in the UFC, has fought in KSW, has fought in Sengoku Raiden Championship, to name a few. Right. So when we say experience, we're talking like some of the best promotions outside and the UFC. Whereas this young guy, unproven so far, but. He's got wicked power, man. Six KO TKOs, never been knocked out. Zero submissions. You know he just likes to keep it on the feet. And what I like about him is he just, he blitzes forward and just throws those big shots. And he's young enough and confident with his chin. Well, he'll take one to give like two or three, right? I think this is going to be an awesome fight. He's pretty well-rounded as well in the sense that like he can keep the fight on his feet, but he hasn't gone up against someone with... As much experience in the grappling in regards to MMA yet, but his power is so deadly. Like, I was looking up some of his knockouts before we started recording here, and some of them are brutal, man. Absolutely brutal. And the fact that he tested himself in kickboxing, too, against Anpo, which he lost that one decision. It still went decision. Anpo wasn't able to knock him out, which is... Which is which is awesome. Now, on paper, his resume isn't anything special yet in that, like, he hasn't fought that really good opponent. Now, he fought uh, Shinji Sasaki, who's, you know, 20 and 12, respectively, but, you know, he lost to a 13 and 6 guy, and his best win is against a 6 and 8. You know what I mean? So, this is definitely going to be his biggest test on paper, but I really, really like how he fights, and I think he's going to snipe that knockout victory. I think this one ends in a knockout for sure. Me too. Me too, because, you know, he has looked, he has, he's looked great in those wins that he's got. Yeah. Like, like you were saying, even though there's, there's not that you know, he's still young in his career. He's still, he's looked fantastic. So it, it's, it's going to be, I think it's going to be a firefight. I think he's got enough uh, grappling to, to, you know, negate the veteran experience. 
So, so I think he's going to be able to keep it striking. And then, you know, like you said, he's got insane power. So it's, it's, it just could probably be a finish right here. Let's just hope they know the assignment and we see some, some superior rule set action in this one. So we, we, we oh, that reminds me, did you see, uh, uh, Jay Krish's interview with Shingo Kasawagi. I haven't watched that one yet. No. Okay. Well, when we when we talk about the superior rule set, we got to um, instead of saying soccer kicks, let's say grounded kicks from now on. I, I know I messed up on the intro saying soccer kicks when I was listening off the superior rule set strikes, but Shingo is the second in in command at the Epic Rising, and he's his efforts are he's trying to get it legalized here in America. Like, because oh, you know, there's, okay. there's a, like a one championship. They've got it legalized in grounded knees, at least. In and Colorado, yeah. Elbows, legalized in Colorado and Georgia. Well, he was, Shingo was saying on that interview with Jay Krish, Jay Krish and Gary, uh, Focus Fights and the We Are Rising podcast. He was, he was saying on that interview that there's an effort underway to get it legalized here in America, like for Hawaii and, you know, on other commissions here. So I, I want to call it. Instead of soccer kicks, let's call it grounded kicks. Yes, grounded yes. kicks and grounded knees. Man, could so, you, oh my God! When Ryzen comes to the United States, we're going there, and the beers are on me, brother. We're meeting up in person, and those beers are on me. Let's, let's wh wherever go. it's at, I'll fly to wherever oh. it's at. We'll meet up, and absolutely, we'll have some drinks. It'll be fantastic. Right. It'll be so much fun. Grounded kicks, I like it. I like it. Yes, um, yes. Just, just to help out the effort. Just yeah. until. They get legalized, then we can go back to soccer kicks. We can call stomps, skull crushers, whatever you want, flying skull crushers. But but wait until it's legalized first, and then you know we'll revert back to calling a soccer kick. So from now on, just call it grounded kicks and grounded knees. I love just that. to help the legalization effort. Hey, anything to get it legalized here in North America, and we can abolish these garbage rules. That are the unified rule set. All right, let's move on here. Funny enough, now I know Bay Noah is, you know part Japanese, but you just said we had a Japanese versus Japanese fighter. We got, again, technically American versus American on this next one, where we got Johnny Case and Bay Noah. Um, oh, I'm just gonna say it right now, this is some textbook Saki Kabara. I'm gonna punish you, Bay Noah, for not being entertaining in your last fight, and we're throwing you into the fire against Johnny Case. Uh, I mean, what are your thoughts on this one? How do you think it's gonna play out? I mean, how do you think Johnny Case is gonna win this one? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly what it is. Uh, like you were saying, Sakaki Barras on the CEO of the Epic Rising, he said in this post fight, he, like he lambasted Bay Noah, like brutally saying, "Oh, you're so boring," and threatened to cut them. Both Bay Noah and his previous opponent, because they put on the most boring fight on the previous card, forty six, or, or um, landmark, whichever one it was, yeah. and so. He was saying, if you, if you ever put on a performance like that again, you're cut, you know, and this is obviously, like you were saying, a punishment bout, a punishment matchmaking, because Johnny Cage is just so much more experienced in mixed martial arts, and, and just, I mean, but Bayno has been showing some improvement on his game with his takedown defense, and of course, he's got excellent striking, because he's a kickboxing crossover, so, I mean, he's still a dangerous fighter, but this is, the deck is really stacked in Johnny Cage's favor. But it, uh, when was the last time John? Isn't he uh, coming off a long layoff, Johnny Case? Yeah, uh, one year and five months. So it's been a while. Okay, so he might be dealing with a little bit of rain rust, but we'll have to see. But still, this is the deck is extremely stacked in Johnny Case's favor and against Bay Noah. Like you said, this is a punishment fight, and, and he's really got to bring it here to really show. You know, it, and if he's gonna go out, he's gotta go out on his shield, basically. So, and I think Johnny Case is just. I mean, he's so much more experienced in mixed martial arts. I could easily see a takedown, a submission here, submission finish. But I would like it striking. I would love to see some more superior rule set action. I mean, we, we're coming off of a couple cards, right, where there hasn't been a superior rule set finish. Yeah. Right? There, there's, been, there's been some superior rule set action, but the last uh, fight that had superior rule set finish was uh, Satoshi Souza, right, and, and his TKO yeah. win. Had a superior rule, you know, some grounded kicks in that in that finish. So, you know, we're due, we're due for some superior rule set finishes, and I'm hoping that happens on this card with all these international fighters and everything. And I'm looking for Johnny Case to really show that he knows the assignment. When we're talking about knows the assignment, we're talking about we want to see superior rule set action. So I'm looking for him to really implement some superior rule set striking here. If he's going to be able to get uh, uh, Benoit to the ground. I want to see some superior rules at grounded knees and grounded kicks. 
I mean, that, that's that's what we want to see. We want to see if you know the assignment. So, and we're looking on Bay Noah's side. You know, how, how much he better be uh, training takedown defense. I mean, he has been showing improvement, but you know, against a veteran like Johnny Case. It's, it's, it's going to have to be really excellent improvement. So we'll see how it goes. But I, I'm just looking for Johnny Case to just dominate this fight. That's, that's my prediction. Yeah. Oh, I got I got Johnny Case as well. For those who don't know, Bay Noah coming out of kickboxing, you know, a very talented kickboxer. I haven't seen enough of his ground game, grappling, takedown, takedown defense yet to have any confidence that he'll even have a chance against Johnny Case. Now, if he blitzes forward, like you said, goes out on his shield and is just like, hey, I have to end this quick and apply pressure knowing that you know what if i go out i go out but like i i think they know his only chance is to like blitz off the blitz off the hop pray johnny case doesn't duck and, and shoot a double leg and and just go out like that because johnny case if and, and if johnny case wants like if he's like you know what i i actually am the better striker in the ring here outside of kickboxing he could maybe play with his food but again we got to give some credit where credit is due to bay no he is a good striker and if johnny case is like okay i respect your striking He's going to finish this on the ground, and he's going to look at Saki Gabara nodding, being like, I got you, boss. I got you. For those who don't know, though, Johnny Case, 28-9-1 as a pro. He's only 34 years of age. He's out of the MMA lab, so a great gym that he trains out of. Uh, 18 KO TKOs, uh, 6 submissions, 4 decisions, 4-3 four and three in rise, and 4-2 and two in the UFC. Actually finished in the UFC uh, above 500, and he had one fight in the PFL that went to a draw. His last fight was actually a boxing match. Funny enough, uh, in 2023, at the end of 2023, and he hasn't been in Ryzen since 2022. Um, so he's been actually boxing and going back and forth. MMA, boxing, and in a bunch of boxing, uh, smaller boxing organizations here in North America as well. So assuming that there's not a lot of ring rust, he should be able to get this one done quick. If there is some ring rust, we might see, you know, we, we might not see him like start to really push on the gas until like round two and if anything that kind of that kind of helps bay noah here so though i do think johnny case is going to win quite handedly um it might be a little bit of a slow start and that actually might play into bay noah's favor but no i i can't wait to see the odds on this one because i imagine johnny case is going to be like you know, like a minus six six seven hundred type of favor on this one. <laughs> probably minus two thousand <laughs> yeah well i mean yeah he is in the world of boxing now so maybe those <laughs> maybe those odds apply my goodness all right let's move on to the next one here we have karsiga Dotbeck against Tetsuya Seiki. Man, I love, I love that there's a Kazakh on this card. And I've actually watched this guy fight in Alash Pride a couple times as well. He is a dangerous, dangerous opponent for Seki. Break this one down for us, brother. Yeah, you know, like, like you're saying, Karshiga Dotbeck. Another international fighter. We were just come off of talking about a fight with Johnny Case, international fighter from America. So this is I want to emphasize again that this card as the most international fighter. I think it's like nine or ten if you count Bay Noah. The most international fighters we've seen on the Ryzen card since before the pandemic. So this is fantastic. I'm absolutely loving it. And he said this guy was from uh, which, which promotion was that? So he's fought in a few different promotions, but recently Alash Pride. But oh, he's well, also Alash Pride. That's right. Which is which is it, it's not as good as Octagon with a C because because now that there's Octagon with a K in uh, Czech and they have a big German roster as well. It, it obviously, it gets confusing. But he uh, has also fought in ACA and ACB, the two top Russian promotions, which are heavily heavily favored for the Russians. Right, like the refs do not stand up fights. Right, whereas in uh, we're in rise and they'll they'll stand up fights even if you're kneeing a guy in the gut it's just not too much da it's not enough damage to keep it on the ground or up against the fence or acb it's like they reward that smothering style so the fact that he was able to get two wins one in acb and one in aca as well is huge absolutely I agree 100 percent. like i said those top russian promotions and he, he's coming from is he uh uzbekistan or, or kyrgyzstan kazakh kazakhstan kazakhstan okay they have some good fighters in Kazakhstan. Oh, yeah. They actually had a fantastic uh, promotion called Bushido Kazakhstan, where uh, it was like a, a, a one-night tournament. They even did 16-man one-night tournaments. Like I Igor Spirit, I think it was, won a couple of those before one championship champion. So they have some good fighters coming out of there. And that region is targeted as par possibly one of the spots where Sakaki Baris, on the CEO of the Epic Ryzen, said he wants to do a, the next international event. Nice. It was one of the, one of the places we're going to be. He name dropped was Uzbekistan. 
Okay. So, you know, they, they're coming off their first international event was in Azerbaijan. So if they if they stay in that region, kind of, you know, that Caucasus yep. area region and they go to Uzbekistan, I can definitely see them highlighting fighters like like uh, Dalbeck here. And so that that's really I'm looking for him to really make a statement here to say, hey, I want to be getting on one of those international cars if you're going to be doing it in that region. Absolutely. So I'm looking for him. And since he's a foreign fighter coming in, I'm really looking to see if he knows the assignment. Can, and utilize the superior rule set like we've seen some other international guys do. So I'm really looking forward to that. And like you said, he's coming in with a ton of experience in the toughest Russian promotions that are happening. So those, I mean, that's that's no joke. So I'm really looking forward to seeing how he adapts to superior rule set here. And I'm, I'm I, I, if you haven't noticed, I'm rooting for the the international fighters here. But I, I really, I mean, Seki is a tough fighter. They're both 30 years old. They're both 30 years old. Both got a great, similar kind of experience as well. So, you know, it's it's going to be a tough test. It, let's go either way. So, but I, but I think Dotsik's going to be able to pull it off here and, and and really you know cement himself as hey, I'm getting on the next international event, especially if it's in that Caucasus region in, in Uzbekistan or Azerbaijan again. So. That's what, I'm, that's what I'm looking to see. And he's competed in Ryzen before a few years ago and lost. So you, you got to think he's like, all right, I'm coming back and I'm getting that win, baby. And I really like this matchup because Seiki, 16-9-1 is a pro. You said at 30 years of age. And he's pretty good everywhere, but he's actually a pretty nasty striker. He's got good power. Nine KO TKOs, two submissions, five decisions in his pro MMA career. Three and two in Ryzen, 11-4-1 and one in ZST. And he's coming off a great win against Oreki Endo. And to be honest, he's lost to just really good opponents in Ryzen. It's not like the, it's not like Seki's losing to Cans. He loses to 15 and 5, 9 and 3, 20 and 14. And out of those three losses, he's, he was only knocked out to uh, Yoshinori Hori, who we know is a dangerous fighter in his own right. So he is pretty well rounded. But man, this Kazakh is a motherfucker. Five and zero oh in his last five fights, and in his last five fights, all first round knockouts. In his last five wins, all first round knockouts, dude. And you got to imagine that this is one of those guys who, especially in that region, started off with a little bit more of a wrestling base. So he has that grappling, whether he wants to use it or not. But he's fallen in love with his he's fallen in love with his hands. And man, his last two knockouts were brutal. He took out a uh, former uh, Ultimate Fighter and UFC fighter Diego Brandao in 35 seconds, and then after that, in the last uh, 20 seconds, took out a very very good fighter who was 14 and six at the time, uh, Kuyomi Matsushima, and. Yeah, his last few wins have been against really good opponents as well, and he's knocking guys out left, right, and center. With that motivation to get a win in the Mighty Ryzen, you got to think that he's, he's going he's gonna to put it on Seki right away. Absolutely, and that's a great point, because uh, you know, the breakdowns that, that they did on Twitter, that Charlie Kasawagi, Shingo, the, the, his nickname's Charlie, Shingo Charlie Kasawagi, was that he does those breakdowns on the Twitter accounts. They were saying that this is a fight between two strikers, so, so you're absolutely right about that, Aisha. I mean, this is this is going to be a striking, hopefully a striker's delight, hopefully a superior rule set striker's delight. So we'll see if this international fighter can can uh, knows the assignment and brings the action. So I'm I'm really looking forward to this one. It's going to be awesome, like you're saying. Both guys just. You no know, knockouts galore. So, ho hoping for a superior rule set striker to light in this one, hundred percent. Well, and how cool will it be if you know they start bringing in more Kazakhs and then eventually kind of do like what they did against Road FC and what they're starting to do with BKFC and on one of their big cards have like a. Uh, Ryzen versus Lash Pride, or v Ryzen versus Octagon with a C, and on that card have like three guys repping Octagon or Lash Pride against three guys repping Ryzen. I I loved that on uh, on Ryzen 46, man. When they had the B, you know Ryzen versus BKFC in that one fight, and then they also had like the the series Road FC versus Ryzen, and those were arguably my favorite fights on the card. Like uh, like Sul Kim, man, that was such a great performance from him representing Road to UFC or Road to <laughs> Road to UFC. I get mixed up now. Road to Road. <laughs> FC. <laughs> yeah, Road FC and Road to UFC. And that's 100% right on, Aisha. That, that's such a great point. I love those versus series. 
they like you're saying a 46 to three versus three japan versus korea i would love it if they do it just like you were saying against different promotions like i, I would love it to see against those russian promotions like acb or or, or whatever i mean they, they have some excellent fighters over there or like you're saying octagon or ksw i mean we got some uh, on this card actually we'll get to it later when we finish breaking it down but there's a road sc guy a road a ufc guy as well there's yeah. there's a, a guy that's um, also going to be on, under contract with ksw as well kind of a, a mini collaboration there as well so which is uh, good be because ryzen and ksw have had their tensions in the past with uh with obviously kleber leaving ksw for ryzen so it's good to see that they're starting to mend that relationship because honestly man those are my two favorite promotions ryzen and ksw and the fact that ksw i don't know if you caught ksw epic a few months ago but that yes, was the first that was the first card where they allowed the superior rule set and furthermore superior rule set in a fucking gi in some of the for some of the fights too so like I would love if KSW starts putting on more shows that allow that rule set. And what better way to do it than a collaboration with the Mighty Ryzen? Oh, a hundred percent, brother! Absolutely, one hundred percent. And you know, instead of a three versus three series, can we get it a five versus five series? I think that'd be even better. Like, and no steroid testing at all, baby. Let's go. <laughs> the UFC, hey, the UFC got rid of USADA. So who cares? Who cares? If KSW shoot you up before you walk out, dude. Have you seen some of these guys? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I mean, dude, absolutely. I mean, if the UFC is not doing it, then who cares? Don't stop, stop drug testing. You know, what's good for UFC should be the, the, the um, standard for the rest of the world. So if they're not doing drug testing no more, or, or they're doing, they have their own company doing drug testing. Yeah. Right. Right. So if they're doing it like that, then everybody else should be doing it like that. So absolutely. But th your point, Aisha is a hundred percent right on those versus series are fantastic. And I love your idea of expanding it from just, you know, versus versus countries to versus different promotions yeah. like yeah. KSW or Octagon or ACB or, or any any other promotion like Road FC as well. I mean, just in Korea and just I love it. That's a, such a great idea. But I would just like it expanded from three to five because I love it so much. Like you were saying, that was probably the best part of 46, right? So it just more of that in the future, 100%. Yeah. And Ryzen and Eve, like, I mean, Sak Sakaki Barasun has been willing to do this forever. I mean, he, he did it with the UFC in the in the Pride days. He did it with Strike Force in the Dream days, right? We know Shinaoki going over fighting, uh, what was it Eddie Alvarez? No, it wasn't Eddie Alvarez. It was because Alvarez was in Dream at the time. It was Gilbert Melendez. Oh, Paul Card you with, with uh, Gilbert Melendez. Yes, yes, that okay. Yes, that's what it was. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, yeah. that was a Strike Force, right? Yeah. Or, or no, was the Bell Tour at the time? Strike Force. No, it was, no, it was Strike Force. Yeah, it was Dream and Strike Force. So like Saki Kabarasan, like that. That's why this is Rise and Fighting Federation, right? It's it's the home of fighting, and they're they're not as stingy with uh, keeping their fighters under one roof like you know the UFC and now. PFL tour is, but uh, yes. Anyways, and, and speaking of PFL tour, they've been collaborating with them since the beginning, since the very first shows. Yep. They've had Bellator fighters on there, and they've been uh, saying that they're going to continue collaborating okay, with that's good. PFL tour people. The Mike Kogan was on a show in Japan. Mike Kogan is is number two. Uh, he's involved with the Bellator shows for PFL tour right now. Right, he was saying he wants to continue the collaboration oh, with yeah, the that's other good. guys. That's good. Talking that's about. Good. You know the the Pitbull Chihiro rematch, super fight rematch. Talking about that, so that that would be another fantastic for the series matchup, like you're talking about. Continue doing a, a series with the the PFL tour, right? And, and Bellator fighters because they I mean, they had that sensational New Year's Eve event with us five versus five, and and yep. then also the Super Rise in the summer. So continue doing that. I just it it'd just be fantastic, and you know expand that to other promotions like you were saying, KSW, Octagon. ACB or you know do the the series with the different countries like J Japan versus Korea on the 46th make Japan versus Russia who knows you know just any of those series events the versus series fantastic love it just, uh, excellent point Aisha 100% yeah because Yachi was on a recent Bellator card and I'm pretty sure it, Ota is going to be on That's one right, coming yes. up as well yeah Yes, Which, yes, oh, Yachi God, was a, 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 a PFL tour co collaboration that was sent over yeah. to PFL to Bellator show and Sh Shinoba Ota Olympic silver medalist one of the rising prospects in Ryzen right now he's being sent over for the next show on June 22nd in, in Bellator Dublin and on this very card Ryzen 47 in the main event 
We'll get to it later when we break down that card. But Sergio Pettis is still currently under contract with Bellator. That was revealed on well, Drew's show. We, we are as a podcast. He had an interview with him. And Sergio said he had like five fights or so left with Bell on his Bellator contract. So that's a collaboration bout on this card on yep. 47. So it is contain it is going strong and it's awesome. And I, I absolutely love I know you love it too, Aisha. We love it. So Scott Barasan, Mike Kogan, all you guys. Keep it up. We absolutely love it. Yeah. Screw Donna Davis, but Hogan, you're the man. <laughs> well, he, he's got to sign off on it too. So I don't, I don't want to hate him too much because he's uh, allowed sorry, it to sorry. happen. So, so, but yeah, that, I mean, and you know, that is good that he is, you know, he, he released Musazi. He re, re up Douglas Lima. So there's only a couple things left. He's got to do, which is, you know, you know, take care of Homasi. And then that other fire that was, I just want to say like, at least Don, Don Davis is starting to do a little bit of the right thing. Like releasing Musazi, I thought was the right move. Oh, so yeah. now he can go earn some money, hopefully in the Epic rising. I was just going to say that's his only option. Cause he ain't going to shot through <laughs> jail. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, and they got a perfect opponent for him, Igor Tanabe, right? So it'd be that'd be perfect for the Bryson middleweight strap right there. I think it'd be awesome. So I mean, and so I, I really like that move, and so I don't want to hate on Don Davis too much because he is also allowing the collaboration with Bellator to continue. So I remember they're they're probably going to be doing a December thirty first mega collaboration yeah. mega event again. So. You know, it's just, it's pretty freaking awesome, I, I got to say. So I just can't wait for the future. And, and after this show, we're going to get into some of the predictions that they're going to be announcing during the Super Rising. Uh, I mean, during the 47s intermission, they're going to be making some, at least five announcements, Kake Barasan said, for the Super Rising show and possibly beyond. So it's, we'll, we'll talk about that after we finish breaking down the fights. Hell yeah. So let's get back to the fights here. We got Spike Carlisle against Kyung Pyo Kim. And honestly, outside of the main event, this is my favorite fight on the card. How do you see this one going? Because both of these guys are awesome. Both of these guys, similar records. Both of these guys still trying to prove something in the Mighty Ryzen. Absolutely, brother. You're 100 percent correct. This, besides the main and co-main, this is arguably the people's main event right here. Yep. Spike Carla, exciting fighter, had a couple of rough fights uh, in the Epic Rising so far. I mean, I mean most recently, close but I mean, though, he has, right? like, he has proved. Oh, go ahead. What? Well, I'd say close fights because he's never been finished. So like, it's always decision, close decision, lost the third round. So then you know, with the way Rise and judges things, they usually are heavily on the third round. So it's not like he's looked horrible, but he just hasn't been able to get that satisfying win the way that he fights. Yeah, yeah. Like you said, Rise and judges as the fight as a whole. So if, if you come on really strong in the third round as well, they'll they'll sometimes give you the fight. But also they they've I mean. Uh, the fight that's uh, fight that's on this card as well, Takeda, one of his fights on that Bellator versus Ryzen card, he arguably had the strongest first round. He had the strongest first round, and his opponent had the uh, one the two uh, uh, consecutive rounds, two follow up rounds, and they still gave the fight to the opponent, even though Takeda had the stronger first round. So it, it's just it, it's it's a different scoring system. I actually like it better than the round by round scoring system, to be honest with you. But you're absolutely yeah, correct. Too. So it is a this court as a whole and Spike's losses were by decision. Like you were saying, he wasn't finished. So and he's been put on he's a proven exciting fighter. You know, proven from from coming over from Bellator, had fantastic fights there. Okay, UFC wins as well, had fantastic fights there as well. Just a, 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 exciting exciting international fighter american fighter i'm definitely rooting for my american fighter here i love how he also embraces the walkouts I, i'm expecting this fantastic walkout from him as well and, and just you know because he is in his previous rise of every single rising bout he's had he's embraced you know the pageantry of the walkouts as well and including his bellator fight yep. fights as well he, he's had some fantastic walkouts so you know, I'm really looking forward to the overall total fight right here from Spike Carlisle, from his walkouts to the performance. I'm looking for him to bounce back from those, you know, couple decision losses here. But he is a proven, exciting fighter, proven high-level fighter. UFC wins everything. So it, it's, I'm really looking forward to this one. And his opponent, this is the opponent I was talking about earlier when I said that there was a road FC veteran and a road to UFC veteran he's got a win on the road to ufc and he's got wins in road fc the top korean promotion so this is this is a this is a really exciting fight right here i cannot wait to see this and i mean 
Gosh, you know, it's hard to pick a winner, but I, I got to go with the American fighter here. I just, I mean, I just like Spike a lot. Um, look, even though he's coming off a couple losses, and you know how big I am on momentum. So, and the momentum is definitely on the Korean fighter's side here. Uh, Chung Po Kim, definitely on his side here because he's coming off a, a, a streak of wins. And you got, you got that, you know, experience. Well, he's got the UFC experience as well on the road to UFC, even though it's not the same as Spike's UFC experience. Because so, Spike was on the actual big UFC cards, yeah. not in, the international cards, right? So I just, man, like you said, I, this is the people's main event right here. Best, one of the best fights, if not the best fight, besides the co-main and main event. And I'm really looking forward to seeing how Spike bounces back from those two. I mean, we already know that he he knows the assignment as well. And so, uh, which means you know, we might see some superior rule set action in this one as well. He's got the grappling, got the striking. So he's got all the tools to get it done here. So I'm really hoping to see a fantastic performance from him. Yeah, and Spike Carlo, 14 wins, 6 losses, 6 KO, TKO, 7 submissions, 1 decisions, never been knocked out, has never been submitted. All 6 of his losses have been via uh, decision, which is crazy. Like, we don't see that in this day and age much anymore, especially with you know a guy like him who's, you know, though he's 31 years of age, He's a veteran now. One and two in the UFC, one and two in Rise, and one and one in Bellator, two and oh in LFA. He's fought in Cage Wars. He's fought in LXF. He, he's fought everywhere, man. He's fought everywhere. And if you look at his losses, like after the UFC, close fight against AJ McKee, decision loss against Roberto de Souza, decision loss against y Yoshinori Hori. So it's not like he's been losing to scrubs at all. And in the UFC, Bill Aljo and Billy Quarantillo, like those are notable names. And at that time, Spike was still, like, up and coming, right? Whereas now, I think he went on a, what was it, a five-fight win streak after that in Cage Wars, Bellator, Ryzen, and a couple, and, a, and another promotion as well, another regional show. Where I mean, he took out a 7-1 and one guy and a 5-3 and three guy, too, respectively. So, I like, Sp I like Spike because he's well-rounded, but he's a damn good freestyle wrestler. The odds at the time of this recording haven't been released yet. I imagine Spike's going to be the favorite, but I'm going to go with the underdog on this one. I'm going to go with Kyung uh, Pyo Kim. He actually originally had a wrestling base yet now is really really fallen in love with his hands and is really good uh, like the only type of strikers he struggles with are in the pocket boxers who employ the jab really good and thrive with those straight punches that's how that ensual jubilee that indian fighter who won road to ufc was able to pick him apart and even then jubilee didn't put him out and it was a very close split decision now that loss I'm glad it was a split decision loss because that loss didn't really age well because Jubilee did not look good in the UFC when he made his uh, debut on the big show. But since then, he's taken out a 6-1 and one guy and a 21-9 and nine guy, both in the mighty rise and both first round finishes, one ground and pound, one rear naked choke. And though there's some cans on his career, like, yeah, he went to UAE Wars and people probably say, oh, he fought in UAE Wars. Look, he fought a guy when he was 9-2 making his debut. So yeah, though the promotion's a good promotion, you can't put a lot of stock in that win. But before then, a 16-8 and eight guy, 8-1 eight and one guy, he's fought a lot of really good opponents. And guess who he lost to unanimous decision in Road to UFC coming up, who is a huge name in the UFC right now. Do you remember? No, no. Who, who is it? I, Armin I, I, Sarukian. He fought. Oh, him. that's right. I was about to look it up right here. <laughs> and he went to a decision with him. So it just shows that, like, this guy has been and is still very talented, just entering his prime. And I think he'll be able to match the ground game of Spike. And if he can keep this on the feet, I think he's a better striker, to be perfectly honest. And he has huh, seven KO TKOs, four decisions, two decisions. So I'm, I imagine he's the underdog. I'm going to go with the Korean on this one. No, you're actually correct, Aisha, because on the the um, topology odds, it has Kim as sixty percent favorite, and oh, the community Spike picks, yeah, forty percent. Okay, okay. So, so it's a sixty-four according to topologies uh, odds. That they're not official odds, but that's yeah. all we got to work with right now. It's sixty forty in favor of of Kyung Po Kim. So you, you might be right there, but I'm I'm still hope, I'm going with the American fighter. I'm hoping he you know he bounces back from those two decision losses and just puts on a sensational performance and just this is supposed to be a, such a huge win for him. So I'm I'm really looking forward to it. and like again I can't wait to see what his walkout's going to be. We might have a, a contender for walkout of the year <laughs> on this one as well. So so we'll see we'll see how it goes. So you know what's actually uh, Spike's path to victory? Pressure. Just constant pressure, constant pace. I think Kim is that dangerous that we might see Spike Carlisle get knocked out for the first time if he wins really? this one. Really? Wow. Yeah. 
wow, that'd be something. That'd be huge. So, so man, I can't wait to see if that prediction comes true or not. So Hell yeah. All right, moving up the card here after the now 20-minute uh, intermission. Thank goodness. Uh, we have <laughs> Koji yes, Takeda. And, 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 that's not know why. That's because they're not on Fuji TV anymore, so they don't have to hit the Fuji TV like 8 p.m. time slot or whatever it was, or 5 p.m. time slot. So now... Whenever they, it goes to intermission, no matter if there was a bunch of finishes or decisions, the intermission is usually only 20 minutes long now, 20 to 25 minutes. And, and that's and that's been consistent ever since they, they left Fuji TV. So that's why I'm expecting the same thing here. Even though it's only nine fights, I was seeing some people say it might be a longer intermission. And it possibly could be because, remember, there's supposed to be five uh, uh, announcements on this yeah. intermission here. And I guess we'll, we'll get to that after the show, after we finish breaking down the fights. But I just want to get that little little side tidbit right there of information. No, absolutely. And that's awesome. And you know, it was a breath of fresh air. I was watching the Deep Osaka card last weekend. And when it went to intermission, I was like, oh, is this going to be like a rise in intermission? No, 15 minutes and we were back at it. I was like, oh, this is, this is amazing. Which, by the way, Deep is crushing it in 2024, putting on some of the best cards that I've seen in a long time. If you guys haven't seen the Osaka card, the Deep Impact Osaka second round, 18 fights. What was it? Like 15 finishes. All or seven out of the eight postlums ended in the first round. It was a beautiful, beautiful thing. Nice. But let's, was there uh, any superior rule set on it or no? One, one guy tried to throw the the grounded kick, but he missed. He missed the guy. But uh, <laughs> in the last postlum, it was. I talked about this on my uh, Rush City Fight Show that we do every Monday on the channel. The both the guys went full Max Holloway Gaethje not for the last 10 seconds but for the whole fight the whole time they were just pointing at the middle and they just swung for the fences knocked knocked each other down no one got knocked out in that one so it went the distance but it was an absolute war so like I said just got to give some flowers to Deep uh, another really good Japanese promotion out there absolutely and that's that's Ryzen's uh, that's quote unquote their feeder organization right yeah. it's like what Deep LFA is over. to the UFC Deep is to Ryzen yeah. Exactly, and uh, for the the women's division in deep, deep jewels, so good. They have some so sensational, good. excellent fighters, which are even being sent over to uh, uh, Invicta. Just had a recent, huge signing of, of a rising veteran and deep champion, Sori Oshima. So that that's that's a very uh, absolutely hundred percent agree. I should let's let's give flowers to the deep promotion. Fantastic, fantastic promotion. Great feeder organization for the Epic Rising. And they allow some superior rule set in, in, in their in their fights. So 100 percent I should uh, give them give deep their flowers. Fantastic promotion. Hey, they're the only other promotion in Japan who employs that set of rule set. Because even Pancrase doesn't allow the all of those all of those rules, right? It's like a it's like a limited or, or a hybrid kind of like one championship. Right, exactly. Yeah, because one championship only allows grounded knees. And twelve to six elbows, apparently. Yeah. But you know, I mean, that's that's cool and everything, and it's great that they're helping get that uh, uh, allowed in America, legalized in America. But at the same time, they don't allow suplex slams. It's like, oh. dude. Dude, don't even get me started on the Jared Brooks. I was blaming Herb Dean because I'll have any excuse to blame Herb Dean for uh, botched stoppage, but uh, yeah, I couldn't blame him for that one. That was a stupid, uh, stupid one rule. But anyways, and thankfully uh, none of that in the Epic Rising. No. All suplexes are allowed. All strikes on the uh, ground are allowed. Everything. It's that's hey. what we call the superior rule set. And, and what a segue because we have the suplex king coming up in this next one, Koji yeah. Takeda against Razabali Shayudulayev. So a Kyrgyzstani undefeated Kyrgyzstani, nine and zero as a pro, who's twenty three years of age, taking on Koji Takeda, uh, the Kyrgyzstani. Like I said, twenty three years of age, two KO TKO seven. Seven submission, zero decision. He has finished every single one of his opponents, and his grappling is very, very good. He's 4-0 in the Lash Pride and 3-0 in ACA. He's fought his last fight in UAE Wars where he took out a 12-1 guy in the second round via rear naked choke. He beat a 5-0 guy in Road FC. He crushed it on ACA Young Eagles. I mean, and, he, and he's 3-0 as an amateur as well. This guy is... At 23 years old, this guy is so dangerous. And though Takeda is in his prime, 28 years of age, a very heavy grappler, he might have his work cut out for him in this one because he's not going to be able to mull this guy and just try to control time his way to a decision, which he has nine of them. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. Man, fantastic segue right there, Aisha. I mean, going into this fight, just... just 
Man, this you're absolutely 100 percent correct. This uh, arguably is one of the other top fights on the card besides the main and co-main. Could arguably be the, the other people's main event, right? I mean, like you were saying, Takeda, he's trying to take over from um for, for the suplex machine a moniker, right? And and you know, from Little Hercules. And you know, this also want to make a point to to say that this uh, Takeda is dropping down. From a uh, uh, lightweight, remember he was he was a lightweight right. staple. But yeah, yeah. So, so he, and he, he just coming off his first fight at featherweight, where he looked great, right? He, remember we were talking about? I think we did the show about that, or yep. was it on the We Were Rising Pop? But we were talking about if he's going to look drained or not in that fight. He didn't look drained at all. Looked strong throughout the whole fight, and so he looked good at featherweight, and and he was a, a, a you know incredibly durable fighter at lightweight a whole weight class above here so uh, this is man this is really a tough test for the for a young fighter here and this fighter you like as you were saying super young uh, just this is one of their highest profile signings that they've had in a while they made a big deal about this when they signed this kid and um raza bali shot Eliyev, like you're saying 20 and 25 yet his record is like all finishes right yeah yep yeah all finishes i mean so this is really this is really his test right here to see if he's got the grappling to go along with that striking and, and mixed martial arts, you know, action that he brings. Seven submissions, though. Seven of his nine finishes have been submissions. So, like, he's a grappler first, a striker second. So that's why this one is going to be a scrambly mess, and it's going to be interesting to see if Takeda can basically ragdoll him, which, I, you know what, I, I don't think he's going to be able to. I think we might see uh, Koji actually throw some hands in this one for the first time in a long time. Really? You think so? Nice. Yeah, because nice. I, mean, I, think, I think the Kyrgyzstani is going to nullify his, his grappling. I think, they're, I think they're about equal, or, you know, I might even give the edge to the younger guy here. Like, he's, he's that much of a savage dude. I, I encourage everyone to go watch some of his finishes. Like, he is insane and... I, again, Takeda's not old by any means. He's in his prime. Hell, he, he's just entering his prime right now. So it's not like he's going to get drained or he's going to have cardio issues or anything like that. But this kid is something else when it comes to the grappling, man. Like, this this is a fun matchup to see, okay, who's the better grappler and who maybe is going to adjust on the fly in uh, Kyoji or uh, Shadu Live and maybe throw in some hands. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I didn't know that, that that was mostly grab. I thought it was mostly knockout. So that's fantastic to, to hear because Takeda... I mean, he he is one of the best grapplers. Like you're saying, he's got the he's really going to test the wrestling, the wrestling of Shadalayev here because he's got excellent wrestling. He wants to take over from Miata as the little Hercules suplex, you know, uh, suplex king. So it, it's it's just man, we're, we're going to see we're going to see if this kid's really tested what he's got in his wrestling department if he's able to get it down and do some grappling. And I hope you're right. I hope it, be, it turns into a striking battle. I hope the, the grappling nullifies each other to where it turns into a striking battle. And let's see if this how this kid adjusts the superior rule set, if he knows the assignment or not. Because Takeda does know the assignment. He actually has one of my favorite combos I've ever seen the, in, in the Epic Rising. It was, I think we mentioned on your show last time, I want to mention it again. He has a combo in one of his previous fights where he does a suplex. Turns around, hits him with a stomp to a ground at knee as he's getting up. So, I mean, just, I mean, is there any better, comp, uh, you know, all, all I was missing was a soccer kick or a grounded kick thrown in there, right? So, I mean, it just, man, the, it, Takeda knows the assignment. Let's just put it that way. So, you know, this kid started lives really, they're, they're thrown to the fire, really, honest, honestly. This is one of the highest profile signings, and they're really going to test him right off the bat against a proven veteran, durable veteran in Takeda that has proven wrestling, proven knows the assignment of the superior rule set. So we're really going to see what this kid shot alive is all about and, and if he's if he's got what it takes to, to break onto the scene as a con title contender in the featherweight division. And, and you know, and same thing uh, on the other flip side for Takeda. If he beats this hot up-and-coming prospect, one of the hottest new signings that Ryzen's done in this new era here since post-pandemic, then he's really going to establish himself, okay, no, I'm the contender here yep. at featherweight. This is this is my new weight class here. I'm, I dropped down from lightweight. I was a contender at lightweight, but now I'm here in featherweight, and I'm totally. the I'm the man here at featherweight that's going to be challenging for that belt soon. So this this is this really could be, you know, I know we're saying Spike Carlisle and Kim could be the people's main event, but this is also another one. I mean, this is honestly this whole card though, Aisha is honestly is banger after banger after banger with these international fighters. So. 
but this one really is, is, is this is a good one as well so i just can't wait it's gonna be awesome i can't wait to watch with you brother it's gonna be so much fun it's gonna be awesome so who are you picking to win this one? I'm leaning the Kyrgyzstani man. I've I I watched out of his nine fights earlier today. I watched seven of them, and I'm convinced. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it didn't take long to watch them all because he's he's taking them all out <laughs> left, right, and center. Yeah. I'm also going with the young up and comer. I mean, this is this is you know he's he's really going to be coming here looking to go. Okay, you know I'm going to justify the hype. This this is why they signed me. I I'm I'm one of the hottest prospects in the game. And he's gonna send a message that hey, I'm I'm coming for that belt. This is this is my division now. I'm coming for that. And and I, I just I just see it as you know, but it's gonna to be tough because like I said, Takeda is very durable. So I, I don't know if, if Shadalai is gonna be able to continue that that uh finish streak, right? Yeah. And no, that's true. It, it's gonna be interesting to see as well what happens if he's not able to get that first or second round finish on Takeda. What happens when he goes in that third round when, yeah. when Takeda drags him into deep waters? Yeah. You know, there are so many different layers to this fight that's really interesting. It's really going to test this young, hot prospect here. So, it, 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 and if, if Shot Alive is not able to get that first, second round finish, dude, he might, he might, he might lose. I mean, this, this we've never seen him test in the third round. I'm so, so excited for this one, man. Like, the more we talk about it, the more I'm, like, getting jacked up for this one. Like, wow. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's going to be awesome. I can't wait to see. But I, I'm also – I'm going with you on your pick as, as a young gun, up-and-comer, can justify his, 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 you know, all the hype and his, that was a big prospect signing and, and just going to get a sensational finish either – probably by a submission, I guess. I, I thought it was going to be striking, but you're saying that most of them are by submission, so yeah. I didn't even realize that. So, but it just, man, I can't wait to see it because, because the kid, he has grappling as well. He specifies in wrestling and wrestling, but he, he, he knows how to grapple as well. So it's, it's going to be a real challenge for shot alive to get that finish. And what's going to happen if he doesn't. And if he goes in the third round, is the kid going to be able to pull it off and show, Hey, no, I'm the, I'm the one that's coming for that belt. Not this young kid. He, he can go get some more wins first. So it's man, I can't wait. Like you're saying, I, I'm, I'm just so hyped for this. This is, <laughs> Man, I can't wait. <laughs> yeah, what a treat of a card. Like, you, I know there's not as many fights as like the New Year's card, for example, but like as far as high level fights, this one, this one rivals it in in my opinion. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I'm I'm upset that there's not even, there's not even ten fights on this card. There's nine fights, and there's only eight mixed martial arts fights. I mean, that's guys, you gotta epic rise and please give us more fights. These are pay per views. They should be. I think there should be 15 fights minimum with, you know, if they're going to have kickboxer BKFC fights on, there should be only two to three of those and give us at least, you know, 12 or so mixed martial arts bouts. But under 10, man, I know look, they're all high level, but it's like, but look, you, know, I, you gotta bump those numbers up. <laughs> I'm closer to the East Coast than you, and I agree. So that, that, that's saying something because I know those people on the East Coast are like, no, 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 nine is good. Nine is good. I can be in bed before five. I don't give a shit. If we're staying up for Ryzen, we're staying up all night, baby. It doesn't matter. I ain't sleeping anyways at this point. <laughs> exactly. Just just tell them watch the replay if you're worried yeah. about your beauty sleep. You know? Yeah. I mean, this is this is, dude. We want as many superior rule set bouts as possible on the oh. card. And if it's a you know the UFC does it what 14 event 14 15 every single time whether yep. it's pay per view or an Apex Shed card. I mean, it's just that that should be the standard, right? At least 14. So. I Bro, mean, especially this, when you're doing a pay-per-view. This last UFC pay-per-view was worse than the friggin' Apex Shed cards. Let's let's be honest. <laughs> like, well, dude, when you have a deep Osaka second round where only ten people are watching live and I'm one of them. When when you have a card like that that is better than UFC 302, bro, you got some problems. But anyways, <laughs> uh, let, let's go to the 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 one and only heavyweight bout in the featured fight of this card: Mikyu Ueda against oh god, oh, what a name here. Prezi <laughs> Premsisla Ko oh my god Kowalsik. I'm gonna try to Kowalsik. Oh my god, there you, you go. oh my god, Jay, you've been practicing this one. My goodness. <laughs> You're right, you caught me. I was last practicing <laughs> before I came on. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, uh, the big boys are here. Uh, before I get into, because I got, I got, I got a lot to say on this one. Because I went back and obviously, like, there's not a lot of pro fights to watch between the two of them. So I, I literally watched all of them earlier today, and I have some thoughts. They, they might go against the grain, but break this one down for me and let me know your prediction. How do you think this one's gonna play out? 
Absolutely. I mean, I'm really looking forward to this one as well. Kowalczyk is, this is the guy that we're talking about who is, I mean, we don't know if he's under contract with KSW or not yet, but he's probably going to be fighting with KSW next. That was what we're talking, that's what they were talking about, I guess, on that, uh, the tweet that Sakaki Barras on the Sea of Epic Horizon was putting out talking about how they're collaborating with KSW again. They smoothed over all those, you know, all, all the, the relationship, you know, because of Clever and all that stuff. So this is a fighter that we're talking about here. That's the KSW crossover fighter, but he's technically not yet, I guess. I mean, we, we got the details from uh, Daniel Zubiki, a, a great friend of the show. Yeah, big shout out to Daniel. Yeah, shout out to Daniel. And he, he just got married, by the way. So congratulations oh. to Daniel on um, getting married as well. Everybody's getting married. I'm literally going to be coming back from a wedding to watch this promotion. Everyone's getting married these days. <laughs> oh, he loves it. I mean, he, he does He does the – whenever there's like a Polish show or anything, he does like the, yep. the commentary, the English commentary. He's a great friend of the show on the We Are Rising podcast all the time, on the Focus Fights podcast all the time. It's just a, And he's in the Rising Discord as well talking about – he's a, really our, one of our insiders into the Polish MMA scene about – that's how we know about this the, the KSW contract that is – I guess is – you know, Pending, Kowalczyk hasn't technically <laughs> signed yet, but he's supposed to, right? So after yeah. this fight, he's probably going to be going over to KSW after this fight. So, and maybe if you know, if Ueda wins, maybe Ueda is going to be challenging to freeze, or, or, or uh, you know, he's fighting a, another fighter as well for the title. He's fighting Augusto Sakai from the UFC. Yeah. So we're going to see if. Oh, wait, does this guy also, did he fight in UFC too yeah, or he not? Came right from, he's coming right from the UFC. Okay, yeah, so he was in Bellator first, then the UFC, and now he's in KSW, challenging for the title against Phil DeFreeze. And this <laughs> fight right here on 47 between Ueda and Kowalczyk, this could be potentially for the next title challenger for that KSW title, potentially. I like, it. I like it, that. It's, it, I mean, we, we don't know for sure, but that could be what the implications of that tweet from Sakaki Barasan Saint talking about the collaboration with KSW pertain directly to this fight right here with Kowalczyk and Ueda. Because we don't, like we're saying, it was we're speculating that it was, you know, Kowalczyk was under contract with KSW, and that's what they were talking about with the collaboration. But uh, Kowalczyk revealed to Daniel Zubiki that he was not technically under contract with KSW yet. So that's why we're talking about maybe. Possibly after this fight, either Kowalczyk or Ueda could be go crossing over to KSW to challenge for the title over there. Because there's no heavyweight title in Ryzen. Correct me if I'm wrong, right? There's no. Yes. yes. Not yes. yes. No, but like right now. And you, that's so interesting because for people who follow the City Light Project YouTube channel know how much respect I have for Phil DeFree. He is the best heavyweight in the world outside of the UFC. 100%. He, he is. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. Now, I know people are going to say Francis Ngannou. Francis Ngannou is yet to step in the smart cage, so I'm still kind of putting him in that, like, UFC category. Outside of Francis Ngannou and John Jones right now, the proof is in the pudding. Phil DeFree defended his KSW belt nine times on a, what, 11-fight win streak right now, and he's cleaned out the heavyweight division in KSW that they're literally having to sign guys to come over and fight him. So... Though both these guys are still have smaller records, that's still just exciting, especially if it's a if it's a guy who came from Ryzen. But anyways, we digress. What what's the breakdown on this one? Okay, so Mikhail U Ueda is a Kyokushin karate fighter, right? And for a heavyweight, it's just ex incredible striking for a heavyweight karate striker. Like we're saying, just and he's been throwing doing some fantastic performances in the Epic Ryzen. He's probably going to be uh, challenging for the Ryzen inaugural t heavyweight title here soon. So, I mean, especially if he wins here against a, a international fighter in Kowalczyk from Poland. So, and, and we just don't know if it's going to be over. And in, in maybe they they bring over Bill DeFries from KSW and doing the inaugural Ryzen heavyweight belt. I mean, we don't know yet. Maybe this could be part of what they're going to announce during the forty-seven intermission. We don't know. I mean, we'll, we'll save that for... Uh, well, actually, no, let's just talk about it right now. Well, Jay Wolf, I was just going to say, I, I don't think Costco makes a big enough bucket of Kirkland Lube for that one. Like, this, <laughs> this is... Like... <laughs> I mean, dude, how awesome would that be if that happened? Oh, I mean, my and, and, God. And, that would be incredible, dude. Absolutely. Absolutely, brother. I mean, just... Just, that'd be absolutely amazing. So we'll, we'll see what happens, though. I mean, there's a lot, a lot of stuff's got to happen first. Uh, this, this fight actually got to happen first. Yeah. <laughs> we're getting ahead of ourselves, but wow. Yeah, we're getting way ahead of ourselves, but still, it's, <laughs> it's so fun to fantasy matchmake and, and fantasy predict, you know, the, the possibilities. Be, and, and that's made possible by Sakaki Barasan and Shingo-san's willingness to, to collaborate 
with all like the, and, and stay true to the, the federation part of the rising fighting federation's name and just climb with all these different promotions across the world it's just it's so awesome so much fun it's part of the reason why the epic rising is my favorite promotion aside from the of course the main things which is the superior rule set and their the, the real grand prix that they do which is you know with the one night grand prix finals where they have more than one fight in one night which by the way in that interview with Jay Krish, Shingo Kasawagi, Char- Shingo Charlie Kasawagi said that they are going to do start doing the the Grand Prix again. Nice. The, nice. Just because they haven't had it for the past couple years doesn't mean that they've given up on that Grand Prix format. So they're going to stay true to. They know that from the Almighty Pride FC on, the the Grand Prix nobody does it better than the Japanese, right? Yeah. So it's just it's great news to hear about that. So, but anyways, getting back to this fight here. Ueda is the the karate striker, Kikushin karate striker, an incredible for a heavyweight too. Look at his previous fights; is incredible striking for a heavyweight, and he's going against an international fighter, Kowalczyk here, who is is in talks with KSW. Is probably going to KSW after this, win or lose. And this, you know, he also uh, they they both have similar experience, right? Both got three wins, so. It's not like they're like one guy is, you know, it, like dwarf the other guy in experience, right? They both got similar levels of experience in mixed martial arts. So it's a, a fantastic matchup for Ueda. I think Ueda's got the higher level opponents, to be honest with you. But still, this Kowalski is an international fighter. He's got some good wins on his record. And he, he, the, the ones that I found footage, he looks good. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to this one. And I believe that. This, I mean, if you wait, a wins here against an international fighter. I think he's he's, he's going to be in the inter, inaugural heavyweight title picture in the very near future. I don't know what that's going to be. Maybe he goes overseas to KSW to fight Phil DeFreeze. Like like I should like you were saying, Phil DeFreeze is arguably one of the best. It, excuse me, one of the best, if not the best, international heavyweight that's out there right now. I mean, there's got a couple others besides Engano and PFL Tour, like Ferrer and. Uh, uh, the one I think is going to take over that spot because Vadim Nemkov, he just jumped up. He just moved up to heavyweight, and he's arguably one of the best, if not the best, light heavyweight on the pl- Him and Jiri and, and Pereira in, in the UFC, right? So him moving up to heavyweight is a huge – that's a huge deal. He looked great when he moved up to heavyweight. Yep. So, the, like, But the, the, still, that's only two other guys, right? Pereira and Nemkov. So Phil DeFries, he's right up there in, in the top five, top three of the international heavyweights, exactly like you were saying, Aisha. So, you know, the winner of this fight between Ueda and Kowalczyk very well could be fighting Phil DeFries or the, the winner of Phil DeFries-Sakai matchup in KSW. The, I mean, we could see that that could, as a real possibility now. That could be what they were talking about with the KSW collaboration. So we're, we're going to see how this one plays out. But I'm looking for Ueda to really show off his his – this Kyokushin karate striking style here. And I, I want to see, you know, if he's able, I want to see some superior rule set, of course, obviously. I want to say every single fight, but really in this bout right here, I mean, if he's able to do, to impressively beat an international fighter that's going to be going to the KSW after this, then that, I mean, how are you going to deny that guy a title shot after that? How, I mean, how are you not going to make the inaugural title belt with Ueda after this fight if he wins, right? It's just, I mean, it's, 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 I mean, that's, it's like manifest destiny for him. It, it, I mean, he's, he's got to come here and he's got to put on, if he puts an impressive performance, dude, he's next in line for a title in KSW or in the Epic Rising, period. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, if Kowalczyk shoots in for a takedown, he's going to get kicked in the face by Ueda. It's just like, he, he's that good with his distance control. And before I get to my breakdown and pick, who, who are you picking for this one? Oh, Ueda. Ueda all okay. the way. I, I really I really enjoy his previous fights. I, I love his style. His striking style is just fantastic, especially for a heavyweight, a big guy. Yeah, man, he he has he has excellent striking, Aisha. Excellent. I, I'm sure you know this, obviously, because you watch it with the with us all the time. So, but yeah, I'm picking you, Ada. He's he's an excellent heavyweight fighter. Yeah, and his win against Sidario, knocking him out with the head kick, was absolutely gorgeous. In his last fight, so big props to him there. And obviously, you know, he's been competing in karate his whole life before he transferred over to MMA. I'm going against the grain on this one. I'm picking the Polish fighter. He's 5-0 and He's five and in his last five fights. But if you look at his amateur career... Now, I know it's amateur, but 
brutal finishes in his amateur career and he went eight and one as an amateur before going pro where he got where he scored three first round knockouts now you said it though like he hasn't beaten the best guys as a pro especially the first two guys he took out with ease but the last guy he fought was a respectable five and three guy and it took him a little bit of time to get going and he realized quickly that i couldn't just straight up knock him out because he landed like the guy he was fighting at a hell of a chin he hit him like three or four times like clean and then was like okay i got a tie clinch and really start getting some shots in the distance and that's where he was able to knock him down so i think if he can close the distance i think if he can close the distance he'll get the better of Ueda because he does hit hard. And we've seen Ueda, like, not to say that he's chinny, but he, he doesn't have no granite ch chin here. Like, he ain't these Polish guys who are like, hit me again, bitch. Like, let's go. So I think that if Ueda keeps us on the outside, it's his fight It's his fight to lose. Where I think the Polish fighter who, again, we haven't seen too much of him outside of the amateurs is, uh, to be able to determine if he has a good gas tank or not. But overall, this is such a great matchup in Rise, and this isn't no freak show heavyweight fight. This is a awesome, like, this is an awesome matchup with two guys, similar records, similar level, different striking styles at heavyweight, but heavyweight strikers, first and foremost, both have power. But yeah, I think the Polish guy, he's better in the pocket, but at range, Ueda's more dangerous. I'm... I was so torn on this one, man, but I'm like I said, I'm going against the grain. I'm picking the Polish fighter. I'm going to trust that he closes the distance. Um, and, you know, this isn't a cage. This is a ring, so you can get a little bit more crazy and blitz, right? And uh, and push away to, into the corner where it's going to be harder for him to get those kicks off because he's not going to be able to utilize the cage to be able to stall a little bit and push his opponent off. So I think topology, man, this one's super close as well. Yeah, pretty close. Uh, way to 59%. Uh, Kowalczyk, 41%. So, yeah, we're, we're going against each other on this one, but this one's going to be an awesome fight, especially with everything that we talked about uh, leading up to this one and kind of the implications for the winner. Yes, 100% agreed. 100% agreed. I, I love that we're picking different fighters to, to win on each on, on each, each fight right here. It's awesome. And yeah, we're no. going against the, you know, both of us on, on each, each one. We're going against what Tapology is saying, too. So just love it. And I can't wait to see what the real, uh, um, the, the official odds are for these fights as well so i mean yeah. a, a lot of these fights that are like you're saying a lot of these fights are 60 40 on tapology here this is a very very evenly matched card top to bottom here so you know the only, only those couple of fights we were talking about earlier you know with, with the the they know punishment fight with johnny <laughs> cage is only the, the really the only one that's like one sided seriously. right yeah seriously speaking of like very close fights similar level and fights with implications as well the co-main event and the main event but let's start with the co-main here we got Kleber Kuike Erps against Juan Archuleta and a Juan coming back after losing to Kaya Sakura but to be honest the fact that he even made it into the ring I give him props like how crazy was it that during Ryzen 46 we were like we, we're, we're two hours until the main event and we don't even know if we have a main event yet and in typical Japanese commission fashion they said Juan if you can make wait one hour Hour before you're supposed to walk out you will be allowed to fight he did it he had some stomach flu he made it got finished by Kaya Sakura with relative ease but uh, I'm glad to see him back here and because he made that weight I think he I think Saki Kibarsan was like okay like respect right like at first we were annoyed that you were gonna kind of ruin this for us but at least you made it um and that's not easy to do Especially as the event's going on, you're backstage sweating it out. Um, so props to Juan there. Seemingly healthy this week going into going into the fight. But uh, yeah, how do you how do you think this one goes down? More of a submission specialist in Kleber, who has fought you know strikers as well, going up against a very all around well rounded guy in Juan Archuleta, who, despite me saying is all well rounded, very much is a wrestling base. Yes, hundred percent. Love that breakdown. I mean, like like you were saying with, with watch like he he missed weight in his previous fight, so he, he was already got a yellow card, was ineligible to win the title, and but he was given the option to make that catch weight before the bout, and he made that catch weight. And like you're saying, Aisha, hundred percent. That was the, the brass Sagaki Baras on all of them. They absolutely love that. And then also, did you see the way that he fought in that New Year's Eve matchup against Kai? Oh yeah. He, since he knew he had the yellow card against him, since he knew he couldn't, uh, you know, he could only get a no contest and couldn't win the belt, right? He he actually he brought it. He brought that fight. He was looking for the kill. Dude, he was looking to kill Kazakura in that fight, 
and it was it was really exciting and, and you know that's it really brought out the dog in, in Juan. I just love to see that and and that's why they they're rewarding him. Yeah. That's why they're rewarding him with this high profile fight. They were saying that this fight is arguably for the number one contender right here. Nice. So and and so also this is one moving up in weight and clever moving up in weight. Clever he he has to really show that he can make this featherweight uh, uh, weight class and Juan Archuleta since he's moving up then you know that's it's going to be really you know bode well for him because you know he's not going to have to to kill himself to cut that weight. He easily made the the bantamweight weight, weight. I mean the featherweight weight limit for the New Year's Eve card, right? Oh yeah, this at, is at yeah. You're right. Minute. You're right. This is one forty six. Damn. Yeah. Oh, this is going to be good then. So yeah, Saki Kapara song rise. They're like, all right, no weight misses from either of you guys. You guys are going to both make weight for this one. <laughs> yes. Yes. Exactly. Well, we still got to see Clever though. Clever, he has missed weight at featherweight before, so we got to make sure that Clever comes in there and make weight. But it, he's going to have the tougher weight cut than Juan. Juan That's moving good. up will have the easier weight cut. Plus, you know, Juan Archuleta, excellent fighter, former Bellator champion, the only man to beat Patchy Mix. Yep. Yep. I want to make sure we, we emphasize that. The only, only man to beat man. Patchy Mix. I mean, huge, huge duck. And, and he beat him convincingly. It wasn't like some, like, split decision. It was a yeah. unanimous decision like total he beat him fair and square let's just put it that way well and the guys who he's lost to patricio pitbull when pitbull was in his prime in 2019 sergio pettis in 2021 and rufion stotts in 2022 like other than kaya Skur recently those are the only guys who he has lost to and he has huge wins he beat suchio kim in bellator um he beat naoki in a way in ryzen he beat ogi kubo in ryzen like and of course patchy mix which is like is his best win and one of the best wins in all of mixed martial arts right now. 100%. I should, 100%. Well, I mean, just as absolutely just well said, a fantastic breakdown of Juan's record right there. And, and you know, the Kai Azakura win that, that where, where he beat Juan, that, that might have propelled Kai Azakura to be signing with the UFC next. 100%. You know, we'll, we'll get after we finish talking about these. Well, well, go ahead. What? I said 100% he's going to the UFC next. We'll get into that after we finish breaking down these fights because that's that might be part of what – I mean, the word on the streets is that's what's going to be one of the five announcements during a 47 intermission is that Kai has signed with the UFC. So we'll see if that happens. But anyways, the point is is that Kai being Juan Archuleta like that and Juan bringing the, just, uh, the absolute dog out and, and you know, showing that, that dog he's got in, him in that fight and, and Kai beating him like that when Juan is calling for the kill, that's going to have propelled – Kai to sign with the UFC. That's how big of a win that was for him over such a guy, uh, guy like Juan Archuleta. So, I mean, really, Juan Archuleta is, like, I should, like you were saying, you know, breaking down his record right there, a, a top, top level fighter. I mean, you know, before they took away the Bellator rankings, he was a top three. He was like, I think he was number three or number two, Bellator Bantamweight, ranked. So, and former champion, everything, like you're saying, the, the, the win over uh, Apache Mix. One of the best in mixed martial arts today, and, and, and it was a, a legit win. So, I mean, Clever has got his work cut out for him. I mean, like you were saying, Juan Archuleta, one of his base is wrestling. So it's gonna be it's gonna be tough for for Clever to get him down to the ground to to because Clever's he's a submission fighter, he's a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu fighter, right? So and he's actually one of the best in the game. Yeah, for the 28 lighter weight submissions. 28 submissions and 32 wins for Kleber, which is unheard of. Yeah, yeah. Him and Satoshi DeSouza, they're both in the same camp. And it, it, that's like iron sharp or steel sharpening steel. I mean, they're just incredible Brazilian jiu-jitsu fighters. Arguably the best for the lightweight divisions. Satoshi DeSouza is the current lightweight champion. And Kleber is trying to get back to becoming the featherweight champion. He was a former featherweight champion. And, and yes, yeah, submissions is his bread and butter. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is his bread and butter. So, it, But he's going to have a real tough time getting uh, getting Juan Archuleta down to the ground. Because Juan Archuleta is an excellent wrestler, excellent grappler. I mean, uh, that, that should be obvious by being the only man to defeat Patchy Mix, right? So it's it's just and, – and, and we know that he has that dog in him. He has the potential to have that dog in him when, in, during the fight and come in there and swing it for the kill, as we saw against Kai Azakura on New Year's Eve. So, I, I mean, really, and to for Skaki Barnes on to say that this but potentially, he, he hasn't outright said that it's official, but he but he pretty much did. He yeah. said that the winner of this bout is the number one contender, right? So, and, and, and I have a theory of why it's not completely official yet, and we'll get into that after we finish breaking down the fights. That's part of what 
is going to be you know one of the five announcements during the 47s intermission but just that he would even say that you know it, it, it implicate that that it, this could possibly be a number one contender fight that's huge that should give extra motivation to each of these fighters to really bring the action here and really separate themselves and really get that w and say dude i'm the number one contender i'm going to be challenging for the belt next and, and Chihiro, i'm coming for you so i'm really looking forward to this one it's, it's a totally worthy co-main event i absolutely oh, yeah. love it and, and you know I, i'm going to pick warner chaletta for the upset here even though and i say it's an upset because clever is the former featherweight champion and so this is his weight class Juan is going up in weight again i want to emphasize that Juan is moving up in weight in this but he's still an excellent he was a huge band in weight so he's not going to be that undersized at featherweight and he's got the rest and to keep it on the feet and we saw that he swings for the kill uh, he knows how to do that you know we saw that in the kaizakura fight so that's why i want to go with Juan archuleta here because he, he really wants to you know establish so uh, he's a, a contender he wants to get back to the belt status and also we got to say Watch that he's he's been signed exclusively to rise now. He, he's a former Bellator fighter, crossover a collaboration Bellator yeah. fighter, right? But now he has been signed exclusively. So that's another uh, little tidbit of, of info for this collaboration that's going on between Bellator and and Ryzen, right? Is that these collaboration fighters they could be, uh, you know, in the future signing with Ryzen after they finish their Bellator contract. So I mean, it just I, I just love to see that. So, and I'm really looking forward to seeing if Juan really, you know, I mean, just, I, I'm just, I'm just looking for him to prove that he's one of the best in the world and that he's, he's worth the next title shot because, because, you know, clever, he's already been to that, that featherweight title, you know, before. So yeah. it's, it's really, it's, it's him trying to get back to that because he, you know, he and, lost and, it to and, the he, scale. He lost it to the scale. Yes, and to prove that he can make the weight at featherweight, right? Yeah. So, because this is pretty, if he can't make the weight this time, they're going to make him bump up. To, yeah, he's not getting a yeah. title shot in featherweight. No way. And, and they'll they'll force him up to lightweight. So it's it's just, and the only reason he doesn't want to fight at lightweight is because that's where Satoshi De Souza is. Well, and he's too small. Let's be perfectly honest. He's too small for lightweight. Yeah. Well, I mean, even at featherweight, Patricio Pitbull showed that that you know he can be beat. So if Juan Archuleta can can employ the same kind of game that Patricio Pitbull did. He's got a real good chance at because Patricio Pitbull is a smaller featherweight, right? I mean, he, that's that's his weight division, but he he really is like built like a bantamweight, weight, even though he's strongest at featherweight. So I'm looking for Watch Letter to be kind of similar to that, and if he has a similar kind of game plan to to the Patricio, which is to of course keep it on the feet, not play the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu game, where which is clever as you know mastery, then. You know, if he can do, and then Patricio was trying to soccer kick him and stomp and stuff. And if Juan can do that, I'm excuse me, Patricio's trying to ground and kick him and stomp and stuff. So if Juan can can incorporate that into his game, I could definitely see Juan winning this. And if he's able to score like a flying stomp knockout, dude, give him the title shot immediately. Yeah. That would be just I'm sensational. Absolutely. I got Juan Archuleta winning this one as well. Funny enough, Tapology, it's spl it's pretty much split down the middle, 51-49% for Kleber, actually. But where I push back on that, and look, like no disrespect to Kleber at all, but he is very much a one-sided, single-lane type fighter. Like, he does have two KOTKOs to his resume, and in fairness, he's never been knocked out. Kleber's only loss via <laughs> disqualification and decision, or one submission loss as well. But what has been his kryptonite? Either smothering wrestlers who can, not, who basically can defend his Iminari rolls and ankle picks and his single legs. But let's be honest, Kleber's best tool is being able to roll into roll into taking you to the ground, threatening your ankle, then going for the body lock, or getting you up against the ropes and getting the body lock and trip and getting the trip takedown. Juan ain't getting trip takedown. All right, like it's not he's not getting taken taken down via the trip, right? And if you look at Kleber's biggest losses, Mateo's Gamera, well, what's his bread and butter? Wrestling, wrestling, wrestling. Patricio Pitbull, counter wrestling, keep it on the feet. And then uh Kenihara, who is kind of like uh Pitbull, or kind of like a hybrid of both of them. Kenihara is so well rounded that like he has very good submission defense, very good wrestling, and very good striking as well. And he was able to take Kleber to a decision, and he and he won that decision respectively. So, like, I think Juan Archuleta has all the tools to beat him, 
But having said that, he just can't make a mistake. Because if he makes a mistake, it's over like that. Because that is how nasty Kleber is with his submissions. The former KSW champion, the former Ryzen champion. I think despite Kleber being a little bit just bigger and lankier, Juan is going to be stronger than him. And as long, again, as long as he doesn't get taken down by Kleber, as long as he can dictate this fight, dictate the pace, dictate where it is, he will win this one. Do I think he like submits or or knocks out Kleber? No. I think this is a I think this is a scrambly back and forth decision victory for Juan Archuleta. I say back and forth because we're gonna see some counter arrest and we're gonna see some submission defense from Juan Archuleta. But I do think for the most part, Juan Archuleta will be controlling the fight will do more damage and won't put himself in those positions where Kleber can score points or get those catches and submission attempts. You know what? I'm as soon as the odds come out though, if Kleber is the underdog, I'm putting like two bucks on him getting the knockout just for shits and giggles. <laughs> <laughs> no, not that's Cause not happened with Sousa. Not Cause it happened with Sousa. No, no, knockout. Cause it happened with Sousa last time and, and that was like plus one thousand that Sousa was gonna get the knockout. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you know, speaking of Kanahara, by beating Kleber, fair and square, decision him, fair and square, like you were saying, Aisha, out wrestling him, out, you know, staying out of his, you know, nullifying his, his, his Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and getting that decision when fair. He got a title shot off of that. Yeah. That's how big it is. That, that's how much they, they, they value a win over Kleber Koeki. And, and, and just, I mean, so that's, that's why Juan's got to do it, man. He's got to get this W. And he's got to establish himself as I'm the next title contender at 145 pounds in the Epic Rising Fighting Federation. And I will be challenged. I mean, that is going to be a huge fight if he can win that to, to e either one, right? Because it would be a rematch with Chihiro for either for, for, for Clever. But if Juan can, can get this W and get it, you know, and if he doesn't, I bet you if it's impressive and he gets a finish, title like shot. if he gets a TKO finish, 100% they're going to give him the next title shot. If it's a decision, like like a like an exciting decision, then it'll get a time. But if it's just a regular decision, then I'm guessing that you know we'll talk about it after that we we preview the main event for the for the announcements in the in the the five announcements. But you know they, they probably will will let something else happen before giving the title shot. But it's still be, having us be a number one contender. And if they have to fight another one, definitely we'll have to fight for in the true number one contender fight next. Possibly. It depends on what the announcements are, but we'll get into that later. But yeah, I cannot wait for this fight, Aisha. It's, it's, I'm, I'm so hyped on it because, you know, it's, it's like I was saying, Juan Archuleta, one of the best in the world, and moving up, you know, and just against a, a former champion. This is, this is a former champion versus former champion bout right here. And, and it's already for the number one contender. And man, I'm just, and it's, both guys know the assignment too. I mean, we saw Juan Archuleta already knows he's thrown ground at knees before, right? Oh yeah. So I mean, we can see he loves this rule set. He was saying on Rampage's podcast too, the Jackson podcast, that like this is my new home. I love fighting in Japan, and what's it was really cool to be able to for him to talk about it with Rampage, who obviously became Rampage in Japan, right? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And also like Rampage. Juan Archuleta and like Spike Carlo on the card, Juan Archuleta embraces the walkout. Oh, yeah. The pageantry yeah. of the walkout. So we could potentially see have two walkout of the year contenders on this 47 card as well. And Juan Archuleta is one of those that could be potentially do that. Because, I mean, remember his New Year's Eve walkout where he's coming so out of the, the full-on drag, uh, the full Jaguar Warrior, Aztec Jaguar Warrior gear? I mean, just went full all out on his walkout. So, I mean, we could see that again here. Uh, who knows? But it, it's just, man, I can't wait to see that as well. The walkout and the fight. It's just going to be so awesome. This is a totally worthy co-main event right here. 100%. Dude, it's a worthy co-main. But this main event of the evening is, dude, this is one of the best main events that I have ever that, that I've ever seen Ryzen put on. This main event could be in the UFC. This could be Absolutely. a UFC main event. And both of these fighters had good UFC careers. One of them had an excellent UFC career in Kyoji Horiguchi, who went 7-1 and one as a young man before 30 years of age in the UFC. His only loss to arguably the greatest fighter of all time, surely the best American of all time. Yeah, step aside, John Jones. In Mighty Mouse, right? So... Kyoji Horiguchi, and even in that fight, like, 
he didn't get completely outclassed. It was just Mighty Mouse is on another level. Demetrius Johnson, like I said, arguably the best American fighter of all time. Some people say he's the best MMA fighter of all time. And Horiguchi, uh, upon leaving the UFC, did so well in Bellator, did so well in Ryzen, won a belt in Bell or won a belt in Bellator, won a belt in Ryzen. He's won the Shuto Grand Prix before he even entered the UFC. I mean, the, the only belt missing in his cabinet is the UFC belt and the damn UFC doesn't want to bring him over as we saw in the last confessions, which makes zero sense. I, I, I oh, it, it makes me sick to be perfectly honest, Jay. Well, but you know what? You know what? Fine. Keep him in the keep him in the the more exciting promotion. I, I would rather watch him where where he's loved, where he's beloved, than you know a promotion that doesn't even want him. But I digress. Uh, he's on a three fight win streak right now. Two of those wins were against top contenders in Rise into Ogi Kubo and Makoto Shinryu, and his only recent losses have been to Sergio Pettis because this is the rematch where he was dominating that fight until that last minute. Spinning back fist from Sergio, which broke... Shout out to our friends at the Rush Hour uh, Fight Podcast. They had a full... One guy in his chat had a full fight parlay, and he just needed Horiguchi to close it out. And he about... You know, he he was basically sick to his stomach when that happened, because he's like, I literally had like 10 plus fight parlay, and that's how it ended after watching Kyoji like dominate the whole fight. But anyways, and Patchy Mix. Patchy Mix, Sergio Pettis, Kaya Sakura, which he got that win back... And then before then, tension in kickboxing, where he went the distance with, and Horiguchi's not even a kickboxer, he goes up against arguably the best Japanese kickboxer of all time, and goes the distance with him. Horiguchi's built different, he's still in his prime at 33 years of age, 15 KO TKOs, 5 submissions, 12 decisions, I mean his grappling and wrestling has come such a long way, he has so many notable wins on his resume, I mean Manel Cap as well, when Manel Cap was in Ryzen, again getting that win back against Kaya Sakura. Oh man, this one, this one is awesome. This one is so awesome. And Sergio Pettis, in respect to him, uh, four and one in his last five fights, lost his last fight, but to the mighty patchy mix, right? So no shame in that whatsoever. Upon leaving the UFC, he's gone on an absolute run. He beat Tyson Nam, Juan Archuleta, obviously Horiguchi's in there as well, Patricio Pitbull, just to name a few. And the guys who he lost to in the UFC, Rob Font, Henry Cejudo, like, come on, man. This guy's an absolute stud. Five and one in Bellator. 9-5 and five in the UFC, 4 KO TKOs, 4 submissions, 15 decisions. Sergio Pettis is very well-rounded, but I and so is Horiguchi, but Horiguchi, despite being the one who was on the losing end of that spinning back fist, he's more dangerous in my opinion. He's more dangerous in my opinion. I feel like Sergio... Sergio's very good at countering and, and letting the fight come to him, where Horiguchi is like, let's go. Pace, 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 pressure, pressure, pressure. However, in the ring, not the cage, it, that aspect might be benefit Sergio a little bit more because it means that Horiguchi is going to have to be a little reckless and not use the cage to his advantage to slow the fight down when he wants a break from that pace. How do you see this one playing out? Um, because I just kind of went over both these guys' accolades, how well they've been doing right now and respectfully both of them in their prime for this rematch, which I think is key. They're in their prime for the rematch. We don't see that in fighting. We see rematches when guys are, you know, outside of their prime. This is... This is, oh man, I'm, I'm like swooning just, just thinking about it. But yeah, I've talked enough here. What is your breakdown? <laughs> oh, and who do you bro, think going to win was, this one? Bro, that was absolutely perfect, Aisha. That was a sensational breakdown right there. I mean, there is so many layers to this main event right here. And this is a true main event. I mean, like you were saying, Aisha, one of the best that the Epic Rise has ever put on. One of the best in Rise and Fighting Federation history. It's just... Man, and like you're saying, they're both of their prime. But there are so many storylines to this fight. Like you're saying, it's it's a a rematch of a fight that Kyoji was dominating till that spinning back fist that went viral and just almost broke the internet. I mean, just and I, I don't want to call it a fluke because we saw Kyo, uh, Sergio practicing that before the fight. But still, a lot of people are saying that was a fluke win, a fluke KO. But you know, and and, and look. And Sergio's going to want to be proven. No, it wasn't, okay? I'm going to come out here. And he was talking on his interviews. I don't know if you've seen some of the interviews, like with We Are Rising Podcast, had a great one. Yeah. He, he knows the assignment. He know, And, and on, if you see any of the, the interviews he's done where they transcribe it on, like, the, the websites and stuff, he's talking about, okay, they asked about this rule set, and he's talking, oh, yeah, I'm looking forward 
to utilize this the superior rule set. He's talking about grounded kicks, groundies, all that. So I mean, he he he's aware. Right, he, he's aware of the assignment, so let's see if he... And both of them have awesome gyms, too. Like, Rufus Sport MMA Academy is one of the higher-end gyms, and obviously Horiguchi training out of American Top Team. So, like I'm saying, like this is, like, the highest level of MMA fight here, and we get the honor to watch it under the superior rule set. Not even in Bellator, which is even better, in my opinion. Yes, yes, and that, you know... Choji's going to be looking at, I mean, I got the Gucci shades on right here to support <laughs> Kyoji Horiguchi. And he, you know, he's looking to prove a point on this fight. He's looking to prove that, you know, one, that, yes, it was a fluke. I was dominating. I should have won that. And, and two, he's going to be showing the UFC. This is what you're missing out on, Dingleberry Dana White. This is what you're freaking, this is what you don't want to pay for. It's watch crazy. watch me beat up, beat down one of your top uh, UFC flyweights uh, fighters, or, or not, was he flyweight or bantamweight? What, whatever he was a uh, like you were saying, Aisha, he was a great UFC fighter. Sergio Pettis was just like Horiguchi was as well. So he's Horiguchi's gonna want to prove to Dingleberry Dana White that you you messed up, you fumbled, Dana, Dana White, you fumbled. You should have signed me. And and, and the, the reason that they gave for not signing Horiguchi is ridiculous. They, they didn't want to pay him the the money. It's like dude, they're paying all these other guys you know like it's it just i mean don't even get me started on, uh, no, they're, they're anyway. bringing guys from road to ufc over internationally where like y you're telling me like money is suck you're telling me this isn't gonna bring millions of viewers from from asia and japan alone they would corner the japanese market they'd be able to finally break into the japanese market if they sign kyoji horaguchi and put him in a title fight that's why they won't they, honestly i said that's why they don't want to do it they don't want to do it. It's not because of the money. As we've seen, they sign all these other fighters. And, and money's not they, an issue. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Money's not an issue to them. The real reason is because they're scared that Kyoji Horiguchi is going to win that UFC title. That's what they don't want. The, the, the politics of it is what is preventing it from happening. Dingleberry crazy. Dana White does not want a Japanese fighter coming over from the Epic Rising, former Bellator champion, all that stuff coming in. And and just uh, which is a real possibility that he would uh, defeat the UFC champion and win the UFC belt on his first fight. That's what they do. That's why they don't want to sign him. That's, that's the real reason. It's because yeah. he's a he's a threat. That is such a good point, though, and I totally didn't even think about that. In that, like, they don't want the Bellator guy, the Ryzen guy, to come in and win, right? Um, and, unless it's Michael Chandler. For <laughs> but, but same thing with Jerry Prohaska. When they signed Jerry Prohaska from the Epic Ryzen Fighting Federation, they were like, "No, you got to fight." You know the 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 top fifteen guy. You got to build your way up first instead of have throwing him right into. He should have thrown as we saw. He should have been in the title fights right away off the bat, but it, it was it was still cool to see him build his way up in the UFC and you know get those spectacular knockouts on the yeah. way to the title fight. I mean, they, they could only put him in two fights before they gave him a title shot because he was just he was just knocking the the UFC guys out in sensational fashion. Arguably, you know, knock out of the year on that spinning back elbow to Reyes. That's what got him the title shot, and then he won the title. You know, yeah. coming straight off of the epic rising, and and it's it's like, but. Horiguchi is like, since Yuri Pahaska was Eastern European, right? Czech, Czech Republic, right? So the fans, they didn't really associate him with like the epic rising as well. You know you know what I mean? Kind of yeah. like with the Anderson Silva situation. Anderson Silva came over from Almighty Pride FC into the UFC and then became one of the UFC, one of the greatest UFC fighters of all time. But they actually tried to cover up that he was a pride fighter first. I know, cage rage. Bro, what? Yeah, exactly. So they were saying, oh, no, he came from cage rage with the, the reverse elbow on Frickland or whatever. And they were trying to cover up that, no, he was a middling fighter in the Pri Almighty Pride FC. And then he comes over to the UFC to become one of the greatest UFC fighters of all time. But there was an active cover up about that because they didn't, because Pride was beating the, beating the snot out of the UFC at the time. Right. Yeah. And they, they just trying to totally suppress that. You know, Pride was selling out every sixty thousand plus in the arenas, and, and so doing pay per views. And, I mean, just just dwarfing the UFC at the time, and that's why. They, and they were trying to cover that up. That no, they wanted the UFC to be the big show, not that they didn't want people to know that Almighty Pride FC was a big show over in Japan, and so and, and also so Anderson Silva was Brazilian, so they didn't really associate him with overseas in Japan like they would do with Kyoji. If they brought Kyoji over. And put him into a title fight immediately, like like he should be, because obviously he's good enough. I mean, even if they tried to make him uh, face a top ten guy first, like they did Jiri, right? 
the fans would still associate Kyoji Horiguchi with coming over from Japan. And if he was able to become the first Japanese uh, 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 UFC champion of, of, the, of the modern era, then fans would associate that, the casual fans would associate that with a Ryzen fighter or a Japanese fighter coming over, coming into the UFC, dominating and getting that belt, which would let the fans know that what we all already know is that there is fantastic international talent out there, which is what the UFC does not. They want to cover that up. Just like with the Anderson Silva situation from him coming over, all my pride FC, all that. It's just, that's what it, it's politics, bro. That's the only reason why Horiguchi's not in the UFC is politics. No, and that, and, and thanks for highlighting that to me. But you know, it's annoying in, in that that whole situation too is another thing that annoys Dana White is friends and training partners not fighting each other. Look how annoyed he was with Aljamain and, and Marab, for example, and how that kind of messed things up in that division. Horiguchi and Pantoja trained together and they have straight up said, we are more than happy to fight each other for that belt. And that's something that usually Dana White salivates over. Like, hell yeah. Like, I, I hate, like, friends don't want to fight friends. This is the fight business. And even that layer wasn't, wasn't enough. Even that wasn't enough to get Horiguchi into the UFC, which is, again, which is unfortunate. But, hey, at least we get to see him fight UFC caliber guys like Sergio Pettis, like Kai Asakura, like Shinryo, who will be probably a UFC fighter eventually in uh, in the superior rule set. But uh, how do you see this one playing out? Who do you pick for the main event of the evening? Okay, I, I honestly, I really expect Horiguchi to really... I mean, he is coming with a chip on his shoulder right now, right? I mean, he, he is... He, like I said, he wants to prove Dingleberry Dana White fumbled by not signing him. He wants to prove that that first fight with Sergio Pettis was a fluke finish, and he wants to prove that he is the best one of the best lighter weight division guys in the world. And, and, and this is not for the belt, right? This is up at 135 pounds yeah. because um, it wasn't enough time for Sergio to drop down to flyweight. And, and um, th this, this, they, they offered it first as a flyweight title fight, right? This is, is going to be a fight of flyweight belt. But Sergio Pettis is like, oh, I can't really make that weight, you know, in this amount of time. So can we do it at, at 135 pounds? I said, okay, sure. And I actually like that better because that is where Sergio beat Horaguchi yep. in Bellator yep. was at 135 pounds, so right? It's a true rematch. It's a true rematch in all of its essence. Yeah. Absolutely. 100%. A true rematch super fight here. Both guys are still in their prime. And just, I mean, and I, I just see I just see Horaguchi just really having that chip on his shoulder, wanting to really show that dude. Like I was saying, the UFC messed up, fumbled, and that Sergio Pettis that first win he, he was he should have got that win, and that was a fluke victory, and, and and just really wanted to establish himself as one of the best lightweight fighters on the planet, and, and that like I said, like that the UFC really messed up for not signing him. He should be fighting Pantoja next for the for the flyweight belt in the UFC. That's what I'm looking for Horaguchi to do. And on the flip side, with Sergio Pettis, Sergio Pettis is coming in here also wanting to prove that it was not a fluke. No, that he legitimately beat Horaguchi fair and square, which I believe he did because there was photos of him practicing that spinning back fist. He was waiting for that. it. He was waiting for that little blitz so he could do it. Exactly. And like you were saying, Aisha, he trains at one of the best gyms, Rufus Sport, with strikers. Right? So he, he he's a great striker as well. So, I mean, and Horiguchi's training at a fantastic gym, too, obviously. ATT training with Pantoja, all that. And, and that's probably another reason why they probably saw him training with Pantoja, get, getting the better of Pantoja in the training, going, hey, this guy would be coming in right away and beating our UFC champion. We can't have that. So that's that's another reason. But anyways, getting back to Pettis. Pettis is also from a fantastic camp. Wants to show that it was no fluke. And also, he is not having to deal with the, the weight cut down to 125. So yeah. he's going to be nice and fresh at, at 135. And, you know, it just, he's really looking to, to, to reestablish himself and, and say, no, I'm still here, right? And because he's coming off a title fight as well in Bellator. And he, this is also another thing I, I love about this that we talked about a little bit earlier. This is a collabor a, a true collaboration fight. This is a true Ryzen versus Bellator fight. Yeah. This is because yeah. Sergio is still under contract with Bellator right now. He said in that interview with We Are Ryzen podcast that he had like four or five fights left on his Bellator deal. So this is a true collaboration fight, and I absolutely love it because look how high profile it is. This is a high. This is a former title challenger 
in Bellator, for, for, excuse me, a former title holder in Bellator that they are, are, are sending over for a collaboration belt with Ryzen. So I just I just love the collaboration with the PFL Tour and Bellator people. Well done, Mike Kogan. That's that's who is, is really facilitating this. He was number two under Scott Coker at Bellator. And I just love that, that you know, Don Davis is getting a lot of uh, uh, shit right now for, you know, certain uh, fighter contracts. But still, I just want to give Don Guilty Davis. Guilty is charged. <laughs> right, right. I mean, so, you know, it's, it's dessert. You know, take care of Hamasi. You know, are you, are you done? You done right by Musazi and Lima. Now it's time to take care of Musazi and the other fighter. But still, I want to give Don Davis props because he he could have said no to the yeah. collaboration, right? I mean, he could have said no. He could have said no. We don't want our fighters going. We don't want to risk our brand. You, you know what I mean? It, like, yep. This is the same the same excuse that the UFC gives for not doing collaboration bouts. Don Davis could have said the same thing for PFL. No, we're, you know we're trying to be the co-leader. You know we, we cannot risk our brand. You know all, all this stuff that he could have said, but he, dude, he did not say that. I want to no, give him true. props for for allowing the collaboration to happen, and he is he is allowing a really high profile fighter to come over and collaborate with 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 Ryan. This is in the Don Davis PFL tour era. This is the highest profile collaboration bout that's happened so yeah. far. So it's it's just again I want to give props to, to them over at PFL Tour for 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 allowing this to happen. I mean this is this is awesome. And the outcome of this fight, win or lose for Sergio, I believe this is going to lead to a, a trilogy bout, right? Because if if what I'm thinking is going to happen, because I I just think uh, Horiguchi is going to I mean he wants to establish I mean this could be uh, this could be so many layers to this. I mean he's got a chip on his shoulder. He was Gucci two belts, right? He was Gucci two belts, had two belts, and he's going to say, hey, I'm also a contender at 135 pounds as well. So, I mean, and also besides just getting that win back over Pettis, and, 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 but if he wins, they could be doing a rematch at flyweight for the title. Pettis could say, okay, now I got time to drop down to flyweight. So he could probably, you know, for his next bout after this, if he loses, he can say, oh, I'm going to drop down to flyweight. Get a win there, and then challenge Horiguchi for the trilogy bout for the belt. And, and, for the and flyweight if he belt, wins, right? then they're hundred percent doing the trilogy at flyweight for the belt. Yeah, exactly. If he pulls off the victory, if Sergio Pettis is able to pull off the victory and say, "No, it was not a fluke at one hundred thirty-five pounds," they're going to say, "Well, you know what? Now it's time to prove it at one hundred twenty-five pounds, which is Horiguchi's real weight." Yeah, that is that is where Horiguchi is excels at is at flyweight that's where he was at in the ufc that and the only reason he was fighting up at bantamweight dude he he was an excellent one of the top five top three bantamweights in the world and, and, and that was not even his weight class that was right. up a weight class where his true weight class was and that patchy mix fight that you were talking about when you're breaking down their their records that was most a lot of people had that as a draw it was close. Yeah, for, Patchy I Mix mean, didn't dominate him by any means. Exactly. And he was exactly. so much bigger than him. So much bigger than him. Exactly. Because Horiguchi's like Demetrius Johnson and Dobson size. He's tiny. <laughs> he's a, he's tiny. <laughs> I mean, that's that's why I was saying there are so many layers to this. And, and it's just I absolutely love it. It's such a great main event. Uh, I just cannot wait. And, and depending on the outcome, I definitely could see a trilogy bout in the future one way or the other at 125 pounds for the title or if they do what i'm hoping they do which is you know uh since Sh shingo said uh, on jake krish's focus fights interview shingo kazawagi shingo son said that they're still going to be doing grand prix thank goodness i mean what what better weight class than flyweight for a Grand Prix. The fans have been asking for that for so long. Shinryu, and Ogikubo, I mean, the list goes on and on. You put all these guys back in there. Horaguchi, Ogikubo, Shinryu, Sergio Pettis. I mean, there's already four right there. And you could, I mean, I mean dude, oh, bro, it would just be one of the greatest Grand Prix of the new era. 100%. And, and, I, and I believe that that might be what they might be doing. Piafelator might send some of their guys there. Road FC might send some of their guys there. KSW might send some of their guys there. Like, oh my god, this could be like a world Grand Prix like the Pride Days. Yes. Oh my god.
I, I'm so glad you brought that because PFL they don't even do they don't even have the bantamweight division in, in in their seasons yet, right? So all their bantamweight guys are fighting in Bellator right now, trying to finish up those contracts, and they let a bunch of fighters go that could easily step cross over to Ryzen and drop down to flyweight. And like you were saying, there is a, a dude across the world. There is a plethora of talent in the lighter weight divisions, especially at flyweight, Uzbekistan, in the Russian promotions, in KSW, all those places. Yeah. I mean, there it could easily they could easily make it happen, brother. Dude, you, know and, what, you know what that you know what that would remind me of? Like that would be like the Olympics of MMA. A hundred percent in that division, 100%. right? That would be so sweet because they would obviously like they'd be repping their promotion, but they'd be repping their country too. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, hundred uh, percent, absolutely, and, and it would just be, dude, that that would be so sensational. I just hope it happens, and, and you know that that could be a perfect segue. I mean, uh, did you you want to talk about any more of the main event, or you want to talk? No, I just want to give about... my my final pick. I, I'm picking Horiguchi to win, and despite Pettis saying that this not being in a cage is going to benefit him because it's gonna, it's gonna force Horiguchi to maybe grapple less and and strike more. Horgu is just just as dangerous, arguably more dangerous as a striker, despite how he lost last time. I don't think that's going to affect him because look what he did to Shinryu. He was still able to pressure him into the corner and get on his back. So I'm actually predicting a Horiguchi finish. I don't think Horiguchi is going to even like try to get in and strike with him for too long. In the beginning, they're going to feel each other. I think he's going to honestly employ the same thing, same game plan he did against Shinryu, and he's going to try to pressure him into the corner, get on his back, and go for the rear naked choke. So I'm picking Horiguchi as my official pick. I don't think he's going to waste any time with this one. I think he's going to be like, yeah, I dragged this out too long and left myself in a position where I could get finished. I'm not leaving any doubt, though. I'm not giving you any rope. I'm, I'm dictating this fight and i think that's how it's gonna go uh you're probably 100 correct because you know he was beating sergio pettis in the first fight on the feet as yep. well as in the grappling right i mean like you were saying on on your in your initial breakdown he, he was pretty much dominating sergio for those first four rounds until a spinning back fist so i mean we could see the same thing here but hey sergio said that he he understands the assignment so let's see if he actually knows the assignment, if he's going to, you know, employ some superior rule sets. It could be very interesting. I yeah. mean, if Horgish gets him down, he's going to look out for that grounded up kick, right? I mean, there's this all kind of, it just adds a, a whole new dynamic to the fights. That's why we love it so much. It makes every single fight just so much more dynamic with, with under superior rule set. Than, than it, it's, just, it's the best. It's the best. But you Absolutely. know, what? one more thing I want to say about this, I forgot to say about Sergio Pettis. And, and it kind of ties into your your previous uh, podcast with Drew, um, where where you guys are talking about uh, how they say risen oh, instead yeah. of rising, and and Sergio Pettis is one of the guys that say risen, and it's just uh, bro, it is so freaking annoying. I, I it's like it's like nails on the chalkboard for me to hear to keep hearing risen instead of rising. It's like oh. why. Why are you not saying it correctly? And you, you know the clip on, on that um on, on that the the City Life Project podcast with Drew that you did, um where you had played the clip of, of Shachi Sitchadong, the one championship CEO. He said it too. Yeah, he said it too. He was he was just shitting on on the Japanese combat sports and like an idiot, you know, uh, and, and on, on his on his you know just had a Takeru fight or one of the biggest superstars in Japanese kickboxing, and he's just shitting on Japanese combat sports. Oh, oh. And who just beat Sexon? Who just beat Sexon? This nobody from Japan came in and worked him. So I'm so, I'm sorry, Shachi. Like, oh, geez. dude, it, Shachi's so dumb. I, I don't understand why. I mean, look, I give the guy props for him and the one championship for getting grounded knees and 12 to 6 elbows legalized in two states so far in America. That is absolutely huge, and I, I love him for it. But everything else, yeah, I just can't Shady stand, bro. Shady business, I, man. Shady business. <laughs> yeah, dude, it's just and, – and, and, you know, his rule set where he d does not allow uh, suplexes anymore. They used to allow grounded kicks. They took the grounded kicks out as well. I mean, but – Oh, it's just throwing, I can't even. I don't want to get started. I could go on an hour long round on just that alone. But but the, the point is, on that clip that you played of him trashing the Japanese combat sports scene, he called it risen yeah. as well, right? And that was obviously done as as it for is disrespectful, right? It, was it wasn't. Yeah, was it, it was intentional everybody. to disrespect. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure that that Sergio is doing it for disrespect or, or rampage or whoever the other people are that's got, he called it risen. 
but it just it is so annoying it's to the point to where i'm dude i always root for american fighters when they go overseas i love my american fighters but in this fight i'm, I'm rooting for horiguchi <laughs> to beat down just one of the reasons is because he keeps calling it risen i want horiguchi to beat him down and go over and say it's rising motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> oh, well, what 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 a note to end our predictions on here before we wrap up we got about five to ten minutes left uh i want you to let me and the listeners know some of your predictions of what fights and what announcements saki kabarasan is going to make both announcements in general you know some high level housekeeping notes in regards to what's going on and what's coming up in the world of Ryzen and the remainder of the fights coming up on Super Ryzen 3 because we had an awesome press conference that Andrew and I talked about in the last podcast we had about half of that fight be announced but let's be honest they weren't they were a lot of big names in Yamen and Ashizawa and things like that but they weren't necessarily the high level MMA fighters so in the last 5 to 10 minutes here in the last segment here let uh, me and the listeners know know your predictions on what Saki Kabarasan will be announcing to the public. Okay, I, I cannot wait to do this the same with you. I've been looking forward to it almost all show. I mean, <laughs> this is, we, we've been building up to it, right? On several yeah. different fights and saying, hey, we've been teasing this, so this is going to be a great segment for, I mean, like you were saying, sensational press conference for Super Ryzen 3 that had some fight, and like you were saying, they, um, it's big on Japanese names, right? And, and, and but, they, but it's still, it's only like four or five fights that have been announced so far. And you know what's crazy about it too? Is that Super Ryzen 3, did you look at ticket sales yet? They, they're they almost all completely sold out already. Wow. And, and, and they, this is, dude, they, they priced these tickets, the highest prices that they have been since the Ryzen began. It was Damn. like 1.1 million yen for the V the VVIP section, Jeez. which is the closest to the cage, yeah. which is $7,000. <laughs> In, in American money. Jeez. That's how much they charge, dude. And it's For already Ren sold Hiromoto out. For main event, like, are you kidding me? <laughs> dude, it's already sold <laughs> out, bro. And, and that, but that Ren Hiromoto versus Makura Azakura main event, that is that's probably the biggest Japanese, you know, names mixed that's martial arts names, against. names, one hundred percent. But like again, the level of like, we're hardcore MMA fans. We know that like that's not going to be the most high level MMA fight. But that's incredible that off their name that just shows how famous Mikuru and Ren are in Japan. Absolutely, and also this is why I was bringing that up to segue into this segment that we're doing. Is one of the rumors is that Pac Man Manny Pacquiao. Oh. Is going to be featured on this card, and that would be a uh, that would be the reason why they they had the prices so high up, uh, 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 of, of why. And we don't know whose opponent's going to be, but I'm guessing that that is one of the five announcements that's going to be made during 47's intermission is going to be making it official that Manny Pac-Man Pacquiao is going to be on the Super Ryzen three card, July 28th. Pacquiao tension boxing, right? So something like that. I mean, I don't know if it's going to be Mayweather, you know, because that has been rumored. But tension since New is Year's boxing Eve. now. Tension is boxing. That would be, oh my, that would be, and he's boxing in Ryzen, no less. Oh my God. Dude, if that happens, that'd be so huge. But I mean, I don't know if it's going to be, it could be that. It could be, what if it's Money Mayweather and the rematch? And then they're, they're, they're doing an exhibition first. And then, depending on the outcome, maybe they do a rematch, an official boxing rematch on New Year's Eve. I mean, Damn. Just, I'm just speculating on that. Yeah, yeah. Not, okay, but they, that, but that's one. It. That's one big announcement. The potential announcement. I like that. Right, right, and that would justify the prices at Super Ryzen three, and because, uh, like we said, there's only a couple fights announced. They're all Japanese fights. They're they're huge name Japanese fights, but it's still like f that. That would make sense of why the ticket prices are so huge. Why it's already sold out. It's just Manny Pacquiao. That it, I mean, it'd be and depend on his opponent. That could command ESPN attention, oh, right? Yeah. If it's if it's the Mayweather Pac Man rematch, that would command ESPN attention. That that that's how huge that fight that's would global. be. That's so yeah. That's global. Yeah. That could be one of the five announcements. The other ones that the word on the streets that I was reading and seeing is that there could be two huge fights talked about in mixed martial arts. And that would be Satoshi De Souza defending his lightweight Ryzen title against. Luis Killer Gustavo, yes, the, the Juan yes. de Silva protege. Yeah, yeah, just absolutely. He deserves killer. the title shot. Gustavo deserves the title shot, man. I've been Andrew, you, myself, Jay, Chris. 
Uh, Daniel, we've all been screaming this. Like, give that man his title shot. Yes, and that is one of the, the highest profile like mixed martial arts that's been that's rumored. It's not official, yeah. but that's the word on the streets of what's going one of the announcements is going to be. Another one for the mixed martial arts bouts could be Sika Izawa, the Adam Wake Queen right now. Arguably the best anime in the entire world right now. She, I mean, she is so incredible. She could be defending her title against Reina Kubota, striker queen Reina, shoot boxing queen Reina wow. Kubota, one of the most gorgeous uh, female fighters in the game. And I'm talking about gorgeous in her looks and in her style of fighting, which is she, I mean, just look, watch her fight. She has. Literally one of the nicest, prettiest flying stomp techniques that we've seen since Shogun Hua in Almighty Pride FC. That is how good it is. It is so good. I want Rand to go around Japan, and I want her to have a seminar on how to throw these flying stomps. That's how good her flying stomp technique is. It's just so pretty. It's, it's incredible. And she is one of the prettiest fighters, uh, I mean, prettiest female fighters on the planet. I mean, with, with no makeup, she goes in there, just, I mean, looks incredible. Just absolutely gorgeous woman. And she's coming off a huge win. Yep. Huge win. And she could be getting a title shot against Sika Izawa, arguably the best atom weight on the planet. That'd be so huge for the Japanese crowd. I, I just I would love to see that. Honestly, one. she in my opinion, I know we were going back and forth on Twitter after the last event. I, I think she looked way better in her last win than Izawa did, right? Because I didn't think Izawa deserved to win that last fight. I really didn't. I thought the Korean I thought the Korean beat her, but it was it was that close of a fight that we were able to have that back and forth conversation, right? Whereas, oh my god, Reyna absolutely dominated her fight. Well, see, the, the Korean in that fight, she was just doing she she did a great job as well, too. I, I mean, and, and it was a sp- decision remember yeah it was a close fight it was a very close fight i was arguing that she did more damage you guys are arguing that there was more you know there's more of an overall control and i rewatched the fight and i'm you know i i 100 understand um and obviously different rule set but but the fact that it was that close compared to izawa who dominated her last fight like you're talking about momentum if this fight does happen man like like just very premature speculation. Like I, I like Izawa's chances. Yeah, yeah, Izawa would definitely be the favorite. But like you're saying, that, that Reina fight, Kim fight, the, the Korean fighter Kim, she was doing or Shim, excuse me, not not Kim, Shim, Yuri Shim. She was she was doing excellent. You know, she but she was just doing like little pitter pat, like like point fighting type yeah. of thing, right? Reina was landing the more damage, and when I went and rewatched it. Uh, Yuri Shim, she didn't rock Reina. She didn't. She didn't drop Reina or anything. No, she only Reina cut her. I think to, that that was it. She only cut her like once. Yeah, one little wobble, but it was it was not a drop. Like I remember yeah. when we were first talking, I thought it was a drop, right? I thought it was an actual knockdown, but it wasn't. So it, it is. It was just like you know, point fighting, striking, and, and but compared to Reina, to where she, I mean, obviously you're right. It was a split decision. Yuri, or was it United States? And we were saying it should have been split. Whatever, it was a close fight, like we were saying. Fight, whatever it was, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and Shim, she was just, she had the, the more volume, right? Even though it wasn't, but Reyna, she had the more powerful strikes, and she had more takedown attempts, yeah. Uh, yeah. where she got to the ground and was threatening with a finish on a submission. That is what actually, I, I believe, what won her the fight yeah. was that sequence where she was threatening with a crucifix finish yeah. where she was landing big elbows everything so and, and i admit i leaned into her because and again shim had some amazing reversals from those positions too that i didn't even think she was able w- would be able to do at all and i admit that maybe i put too much weight on well look, sh- she reversed her which we never thought she would do on the ground because we thought if she got to the ground she was lost but regardless i encourage all you guys to go watch that fight and let us know in the comments who you think won that one but uh we got two more minutes left here jay wolf what other what other predictions do you have in regards to what oh, oh will announce? you only got two minutes we can't go a little bit over no i'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. <laughs> i'll do it real quick but yeah yeah go watch the fight and remember that it was as judged as a whole not round yeah. by round so just keep that in mind when you're watching the yuri shim versus Reina fight but yeah that is, that is a second mixed martial arts fight that could be announced as one of the five announcements during 47's intermission is izawa versus Reina for the Adam Weight title. And that's been a fight that's been in the works for a long time. They wanted to make that happen. So that, that and it would be huge for the Japanese fan base as well. And, and, you know, we love both fighters as well. I'm sure you do. Obviously you do as well, but it just, that'd be a great fight. Now the other, th- there's two more announcements that we think is going to be happening. Now, one of them, we do get it out of the way real quick. So to keep it within the two minutes, like you're saying, and that would be 
we're the, the word on the streets is that they're going to officially announce Kai Azakura, one of the Azakura Action Bros, is going to the UFC officially. Yeah. And we don't know if he's going to like. We're speculating: is he going to have one more fight in Ryzen to you know defend his title? He's a ter- current Ryzen title holder off that one arch ladder win, or is he going to go straight to the UFC and just vacate the title at Ryzen 47's intermission? We don't know. But that's what we're going to find out during 47. But that could be. That's what the word on the streets is. One of the one of the five announcements is going to be yep. officially. Kai is signing to the UFC. Well, I mean, he's been be training. Sincere. He's been training in Vegas. He trains at Syndicate. Vince Morales is his lead sparring partner, and he has been appearing at the UFC PI as well. So I mean, connect all the dots too. If he's coming to the United States to train so much, anyways, if his second gym is Syndicate, if Vince Morales is in Vegas and that's his teammate, I mean, it just makes perfect sense. Exactly, it does. It makes perfect sense. Plus, he's got history with Manel Cape. Or cop, I, I I don't know why people keep saying cop, but it's I I call it cape, man, oh cape. That's the way it's spelled. The Anyways, Ryzen. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but 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 Kai does have a history with man, oh cape, and they're they're one and one, right? So th- so that would be a dude, that'd be a perfect title eliminator for them to do in the UFC is the trilogy bout between Kai Azakura and man, oh cape for a title shot. Love I mean, at bantamweight or flyweight, whatever. It just that'd be a perfect perfect number one contender fight. For, for UFC to do. And Azakura, I, I call him as part of the Azakura Action Bros, as I like to call him, because they have been consistently bringing the action in the Epic Rising Fighting Federation. And, and, you know, for a couple of fights there, they kind of were, you know, I, I lost, I, I, I had taken away the Azakura Action Bro moniker for him. But in that one Archuleta bout on New Year's Eve, Boy, he, bro, he earned it back. That yeah. was a sensational performance, sensational TKO victory over Juan Archuleta, a body shot, devastating knee, knee, a rib crusher knee that he that he got Juan Archuleta with, and Juan Archuleta was looking to kill him in that fight, bro. He was he was trying to kill him in that fight, and Kai got it done and got the finish victory. And uh, honestly, to me, that's what I think is that's why the UFC is like, okay, we we can't ignore this guy anymore. We, we got to sign him. So I, I, I think that's, that could be one of the announcements. And then let's go to the fifth announcement here real quick. That is word on the streets of what it's going to be. And <clears throat> this is uh, going into what we were talking about earlier with the collaboration. Go, th- this could be – they could make official the Chihiro versus Patricio pound for pound Pitbull super fight rematch of the oh, yeah. arguably the upset of the year last year yeah. and – the KO of the year last year in 2023. I'm talking about Chihiro Suzuki defeat, uh, knocked out the first man to knock out Patricio pound for pound Pitbull and in and, and just in sensational fashion. Go go look at that knockout. Patricio, his head it bounces off each rope on the way down. It was just so sensational. And they were both, I mean, they're, they're, it was so devastating that they're trying to make excuses saying, oh, it was late notice and and it was a different weight class, blah, blah, blah. But no, it was even for both of them. For, they, they were both arguably coming off of a loss. Uh, Chihiro, was com- I mean, Chihiro was coming off of a, a, a the weight miss loss where of Clever, right? Clever had missed weight, so he could not win the title, but he still beat uh, uh, Chihiro Suzuki. And Pound- Patricio Pound Pound Pitbull was coming off a loss to uh, um, <clears throat> the Bantamweight. Uh, no, it, it, when he dropped down to try to... Trying to make history at Bantamweight. Was that to Sergio Pettis? Uh, yeah. Yes. Okay. To Sergio Pettis. And and, and Patricio is coming off of that loss and, and, and moving back up to Featherweight where his real weight was. But this fight was, since it was a late notice, it was to re, it was to um save the card. Because that was the card, Super Ryzen 3, uh, Super Ryzen 2 last year, Bellator versus Ryzen, where AJ McKee had got staff infection. The week of, right? And he had to pull out of the fight the week of. And Satoshi De Souza stepped in late notice to save that Bellator Lightweight Grand Prix. And Chihiro Suzuki and Patricio Pound Pound Pitbull stepped up on a week's notice, both of them late notice to save that card, add a huge fight to that card be, to, you know, to, to negate the losing the star power of AJ McKee on that card. They were both coming off of the same short notice. They both are the same weight class at featherweight, 145 pounds. For that fight, they had also signed a, for, for a catch weight of 155 pounds. So they didn't have to cut down in, in, you know, in, in, on a week's notice. 
So and they were both coming off of a loss. So they were both coming into equal momentum, equal notice, and equal weight. So it was. Uh, I don't want. I don't want to hear any excuses. Yeah. Saying you know the only the only excuse they can say is that it was Patricio on the uh, Chihiro's home turf yeah, in Japan. In Japan, that's the only thing. And this announcement with uh, spe- the speculation word on the streets is is that it's going to be announced for possibly Bellator San Diego in September. And if it's not, and that would be Chihiro coming over to Bellator to wow. America. Fighting under the under the unified rule set, not the superior rule set, so that that would kind of you know kind of kind of give back that that particular you yep. know storyline of that rematch fight, or it could be there they announce it for the December thirty first collaboration mega event that's going to happen for the title. and make it for yes the title. for the title for for all the titles and that that's the collab that's the one that was you know they they leaked the announcement. Yeah. of the December 31st collaboration bout on, on the, the PFL tour graphic. And then they took it away and now they have a question mark. So yeah, it's yeah. like, but, but, you know, we'll we see. All know. We all know. Yeah. Right, right, right. So we'll see if that's going to be the fifth announcement. <clears throat> I mean, there's other things that, that we're saying that it could be as well. Like we were talking about on the show, talking about the KSW collaboration. Maybe you wait is going over. Or, or, maybe, or maybe, maybe they bring back Bulkoff. He doesn't enter the K1 Grand Prix because he had like there was so much hype. You know, like even I was live streaming, man. And when Bulkoff was fighting, I had 300 people in my live chat. And then when he stopped fighting, they all left. <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah, awesome. dude, it was whack, dude. I was like, you gotta be kidding. Like, this is, like we do. He's he's he is God to the Thai people, right? Like, oh, awesome. You know, so, and, and if he does not, if, he, if, if he's not the wild card for the K1 Grand Prix, which would be, I don't understand why they wouldn't do that. He right. should be the wild card for that K1 I think Grand so too. Prix. But if not, us Ryzen fans, we could possibly see him back in Ryzen because Sakaki Barasan knows that he is he is viewership and he has money and he still got it at this you know at forty plus years of age. And who do you think they match him up with, Ampo or somebody? Yeah, because that's who. I mean, that's Ampo came into the cage and said, "I want that rematch." So yes, okay, so perfect. That that'd be another one. So it, it's and then. Is there any other ones you think it could be? That, like, that's like, all. I mean, you've honestly you've you've checked more boxes than I even than I had drawn up. So like that is that is awesome. But uh, man, we've gone two hours here for a predictions video. I think we should wrap it up now. This was amazing. We will one hundred percent bring you back to do this again. Not only for Super Rise and Three Men, but for every single card. Like you are you are an honorary member of the City Life Project now. You are a Ryzen preview and predictions guy. The, the title it's official. Jay Wolf, you're an honorary city lifer now covering the mighty Ryzen, and I really appreciate your time, man. Before we wrap up here, I mean, let us know where the folks can find you and uh, and give a shout out to maybe some of the other shows that you have appeared on recently and are going to be appearing on, you know, uh, pre or post this event. Oh, oh, thank you so much, brother. I really appreciate that. That, that was so, for the kind words, that was so awesome. Well, and to hear. I'm going se- to send you a hoodie as well. I'm going to send you a city life hoodie. So after this, let me know your, your shipping address and everything, and I'm going to send you some swag. Oh, I'll rock the heck out of of that bro it's gonna be I'm, i'll wear the f- out of it uh, costly go. so so i mean just make a double x to l so i can fit it and, and i'll rock the f- out of that done I and done wait. brother i done love and being done. on the city life project I I, I I love your show aisha i love the energy and passion that you bring to the sport of mixed martial arts and and, and that you you know you cover the epic rising so fantastically i just I, I just can't express my thanks enough to you and i just love being on here are, are you going to do a, 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 a review show at all? Do you do review shows or no? I might. My bandwidth is pretty maxed out right now, so we'll, we'll see. If I, if I do, you're the first one I'll call. But, I mean, I've said this to the boys, too. We are Rising Podcast. They have my number. I can join your guys' show. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, they, they've been bugging me to, to, to start my own YouTube channel and start my own podcast. So if I ever do that, you're one of the first guests yeah. on. Thanks, so I just absolutely love coming here to the City Life Project. Make sure everybody likes and subscribes to the City Life Project. You do such fantastic work, and, and it just your shows are great. I mean, you, you do like, like you were saying, for the deep show, you had a live stream going. I was actually one of the, the, the watchers on that. That's how I knew that there was some – that there was a leg shaker – a KO on that that card yeah. where you were you were hitting the 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 horn uh, uh, um um uh, uh sound bite right for when that that was happening it was <laughs> dude, it was so awesome I was loving that and, and then um you, dude you, the other shows you like I was saying you, the shows you did with Drew the impromptu show 
that was fantastic. Love listening to that. And, and the regular city life party that you do all the time. I mean, you cover it all, but I just, I just love the work that you do with, with the Epic Rise and Fighting Federation. I love how passionate you are. And thank you for having me on. And, you know, I mean, if, like I said, if you do a review show, I'd love to come on, maybe talk about what the, the announcements were oh, and be, yeah. in, 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 in addition to the, the, you know, the, the results from the fight card, because I mean, there's a couple, we do, I could even go on for longer about the announcements. We didn't even get into, there could be announcing the international events where the next one's going to take place. Then you get, you know, and we could go into the collaboration, like you were saying with yeah. the, the versus series of the, the Japan versus Korea, or, you know, Dude, we can, we, there are so many possibilities for now. Our uh, a flyweight Grand Prix officially announced. So many possibilities. It just, I, I just, I just love doing the show. Ash, I can't thank you enough. And yeah, if, if, you, if you want to follow me on on Twitter, I'm at J A Y Y O L F one. That is my I, that's been my screen name since all the way back in uh, when I first started posting on Yahoo boards in like 06 or whatever it was. That's how you know it's me. I'm the same person and it's misspelled on purpose because way back then there was like a million other J wolves. And I was like, <laughs> I, I was like, forget it. Just put J Y Y that's, that's me. And it's easy to search. And if you're a real person, I will follow you back instantly. And I answer my DMS, everything. So, you know, if you want to follow me, follow me there. On, on X, I should say, instead of Twitter, and I'll follow you right back. And also on the Ryzen Discord, as a lot of fun. I actually spend most of my time in the Ryzen Discord because it's not public like, like Twitter X is. And it's just there's a lot of like-minded fans in there, just like Aisha, passionate about uh, uh, mixed martial arts and especially the Ryzen Fighting Federation. We talk we talk everything in there as well. We don't just talk Ryzen, but that is the main focus of the Ryzen Discord chat, obviously. And it's a lot of fun, so join there. I mean, we got guys like Daniel Zubiki that we shouted out earlier in the show. The, the Polish announcer, friend of the show, he's in there as well. I mean, we got so many guys in there. Jay Chris, you know, uh, Drew from We Are Rising Podcast, boys are in there. They're, they're the ones that run that that channel. So it's just a lot of fun. So join there. And for the shows that Aisha was talking about that I'll be appearing on, um, you guys know that I do the show sometimes with Teep to the Junk. And and um, I'll be doing a – hopefully we're going to do a, a Rising 47 preview show. Look out for that this week. So hopefully you're gonna be doing that, and then the another big one that I'm doing that I really like, like doing is with Jay Krish, Jay Christian Gary, uh, the We Are Rising podcast. He is the one that runs the Focus Fights uh, uh, podcast and that Focus Fights channel now, and we're gonna be doing a 47 preview as well. We're gonna get into all the things that Shingo Kasawagi was saying on that sensational interview that he did. So check that out as well, and check for me on, on that. So on Twitter. And, and on the Ryzen Discord and the um, the Teeth to the Junks channel or, 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 or it's on YouTube, Random Acoustic Thoughts is that he does boxing, OG boxing work, as well as, you know, we do some Bellator, PFL tour previews and stuff, stuff like that. But I'm finally going to do a Ryzen his Bellator, preview. which is awesome. He's a Bellator stand and, and I respect him for that. Absolutely. I mean, he was one of the Bellator gurus, I like to call him. He just, he do everything Bellator. So, and I'm finally getting him to, to, to really do a Ryzen preview show since there's so many, since the, the main event is a, a Bellator yep. crossover, official Bellator crossover collaboration super fight, right? So really looking forward to that. And then I'm really looking forward to the, the focus fights, uh, uh, audio podcast with Jay Krish. And, and that's gonna be a lot of fun, but honestly, I should, this one right here, the city life project, it just don't get any better. I love your energy. It's just so much fun. I can't wait to do it. I don't want it to end. I don't I want to, can we go three I hours? Know. I mean, this is freaking awesome. I'm having so much, I can't wait to watch these fights with you. It's just, man, I just, it's so much fun. I love being on here. Thank you for having me on. Always. Thank you to the fans for listening. I know we, I, I know I like to rant and go on a long tangents, but it just, I just love this. I I, I love it. I, I really do. I love the, the epic rise in fighting federation and superior rule set. It's my favorite. I, I, I watch it all. You know, I watch UFC too as well, obviously, but I just, Nothing compares to the Epic Rise and Fighting Federation of Superior Rules. I just I love it so much. And honestly, I should the City Life Project is it's the freaking all it's us the bomb. Do we can, do we still say that? Can we still say that? It's it's the freaking bomb bay. I love the City Life Project. Thank you for having me, brother. And just man, I just can't wait to watch Rise of 47 with you. It's just been so much fun.
Jay Wolf, you're the man, dude. Like I said, the one person out there who's more passionate about Japanese MMA than me, and I didn't think that would be possible. Guys, like and subscribe, enjoy the fights, and we'll see you on the next one. Peace. Pride never die. Pride is rising. And we out. Baby.